right, and I think we are good. Testing audio, testing, testing. We'll give people another minute or two to show up. Okay, we're going to get started now. So, first off, a bit of background. Uh, this is a slide deck that is ultimately intended to be used for an in-person class, so obviously some of the things about, you know, bathroom and emergency evacuation procedures and so on don't apply since we're not doing a lab component today. Um, but slides are on the GitHub. Um, I don't remember if I pushed the most recent draft prior to uh, today, but certainly when we wrap up, I will push the most recent changes. So anybody who wants the current files can go grab them. And uh, again, stop and ask questions at any time. Don't wait until the end. This is probably going to be a two-ish hour lecture, and uh, you'll forget your questions if you wait until the end. So just ask and chat me time, and I'll get to them. So overall, what we're looking at for you to take away from this uh, is uh, understanding a at least a brief uh, overview of all the different common kinds of scope probes out there, which ones are good for certain types of measurements. If you've got ha your uh, inventory has several probes available, then you need to be able to determine which one is most appropriate for a given measurement. Uh, um, and obviously how to get the best performance out of a given probe. There are lots of easy ways to get garbage measurements or at least less useful data than you could if you understood all the, again, limitations and non-idealities of the probe and how to get the most useful measurements out of it. And uh, also, of course, this applies to if you don't necessarily have the perfect probe for a given measurement, understanding exactly how the ones you do have function and what the limitations are will be useful if you want to try to get a good enough measurement with what you've got on hand or do you actually need to try and track down something specialized for your particular measurement. So we're going to be going over a bunch of different types of probes here. We've got the classic RC divider probe, we've got resistive probes, active voltage probes, differential probes, power rail probes, near field loop probes, current probes, high voltage probes, and uh, I'm sure there's some that I've left out. Um, also on that note, this is a draft slide deck. There are a few spots, especially towards the ends in like the current probe section and so on, that I am still adding content to. So if anyone has suggestions on things that you think are either unclear or you would like to see more detail on the final version of the class, definitely let me know and uh, I will take your feedback into account. So a little bit of background for those who aren't familiar with me in particular. Uh, I've been doing probe stuff for a while now. Uh, originally got started in, okay, I will adjust the mic a little bit. Uh, originally got started in computer science. By the time I was in grad school, started shifting my focus towards more embedded systems. Got my PhD focusing on embedded systems, security, operating system architecture, system on chip stuff, kind of blurring all of that together. And now my day job is embedded system security. And in my spare time, I do high speed digital board design and open source test equipment design. And additionally, uh, gel scope client side of things. Uh, I'm the main developer and uh, write most of the user interface code, a good chunk of the protocol decodes and so on. So you'll see me using Gelscope Client for some of the analysis and some of the uh, examples later on. So obviously the fundamental question that we're trying to answer here is why would you use one probe over another? The one on the left is 10 bucks on Amazon. The one on the right is a five digit price tag. And Obviously, there are times when you'd want to use one. There's times when you'd want to use the other. All right, I will turn the volume up a little bit. 
All right, is that a little bit better? So first question is going to be, what is a probe exactly? Obviously, we've got the electrical component, but we can't forget the mechanical component. You need to be able to physically hold the probe in order to be able to uh, get a signal into your scope. And if you don't have good ergonomics, then it's going to be difficult to use. Uh, and then obviously there's the electrical component as well. You need to be able to take the signal off of the board and you need to get it into your instrument, which is usually an oscilloscope. It can also be a spectrum analyzer, a VNA, et cetera. So in a perfect world, what would a probe do? It would have no alteration whatsoever on the device behavior. So it'll act exactly the same with the probe on without. It'll have no noise, it'll have no loss, it'll be free or nearly free, have infinite frequency response. Well, unfortunately, nobody makes such a probe, so we have to live with the realities of physics and what's actually available on the market or what can be easily manufactured. And so based on that, there's always going to be trade-offs. And for one measurement, the best probe may not be the same as the best probe for a different application. And so the different things you would want to take into account when you're considering one probe versus another. Uh, the bandwidth, obviously, is the main spec everybody sees mentioned uh, as, you know, oh, this is a 500 megahertz probe. This is a 1 gigahertz probe. But then you also have to consider the attenuation, noise. Flatness is one that is generally not published very well. Uh, I almost never see probes specifying frequency response curves, which is honestly, as someone who spent a lot of time putting probes on VNAs, it's probably because they don't really want to advertise how not flat their probes really are. Uh, but we'll get to that. And then there's loading, voltage range, linearity. Obviously, cost is a concern. Durability, you don't want a probe that's going to fall apart if you look at it sideways. And then ergonomics. There's actually there's a few examples of probes you're going to see later on in uh, the... Uh, lecture that have really good electrical performance and are just really awkward to use and it it detracts from what would otherwise be a very nice design and uh, most of the examples that we're going to see here are drawn from what i have in my inventory at my lab and uh, i run mostly lacroix and pico gear don't take this as an endorsement of their products over others. I'm sure there's plenty of equally good probes from Keysight or Tech or Rodenschwartz or whatever else. But if I need to go take an example of something, I'm going to take a picture of what I've got on my bench and not go out and track down some competing manufacturer's probe that may have similar performance. So, again, these, these are just examples drawn from what I've got handy. And... Uh, now, before we get too into any details, we are going to be talking a lot about S parameters when we're discussing the performance of probes under different conditions. And so I'm just going to have a little bit of background here for those of you who may not have studied RF design in detail. So S parameters or scattering parameters are a way of describing the performance of a circuit that has some number of ports on it. So if you've got, say, an intent, it would be a one port network. A typical probe is a two port network. A differential probe is a three port network and so on. And so you apply RF energy to some port and signal comes out of that port and all the other ones. And obviously any of these outputs are going to have some phase shift, they're going to have some gain or loss in amplitude and so on. And so we can model this as what's known as a scattering matrix where we've got an element for each combination of input and output that describes what happens for signal coming in the first port and going to the next one. So our notation is pretty straightforward. You've got S, X, Y is the path from X to Y. So S21 is the path to port 2 from port 1. S11 is power going from port 1 looping back to port 1. S12 is the reverse path. S22 is the reflected path. Um, it is a little bit confusing orientation-wise. Honestly, I think it would have made more sense if it was from two, and uh, having it be two from is a little bit confusing, but once you get used to it, you're... It, it's not so bad. And uh, each element of this matrix is actually a complex number. Uh, you may see them referenced in uh, an actual data file as either real and imaginary or magnitude and angle. For the purposes of our discussion here, we're going to be using magnitude and angle format because that's generally a lot easier to work with if you just see a uh, 
gain or loss curve in DB versus frequency is a lot easier to work with than looking at real and imaginary components. And obviously the value is frequency dependent. Uh, there are also going to be nonlinearities to consider, especially when we start getting into active probes or even passive probes can theoretically have passive intermodulation and things like that going on. Uh, we're not going to be getting into any detail on that for today, so we're going to be assuming the probes are strictly linear and we're going to be using just a linear S parameter model. And so certainly if you're trying to do more detailed characterization of active probes, you would need to consider nonlinearities. Um, and so to answer the audience question, uh, there is something very similar. I actually mentioned it in the slides. Keysight has what they call X parameters, which my understanding is essentially an extended S parameter format that specifies not only the output signal at the stimulus frequency, but at harmonics of it that describes nonlinear effects. Uh, most VNAs don't support this. Most analysis and simulation tools don't support this. Um, so while it does exist, you pretty much, as far as I know, you have to be in the Keysight ecosystem to really make use of that format. I don't think there is any industry standard format that handles that at this time. Uh, that may change down the road, who knows, but I don't think the X parameter format is currently published and I haven't seen anything from anybody but Keysight that supports it. And uh, so getting on to that, as far as where US parameters come from, typically it's going to be off of VNA. It is obviously possible to use simulation and I'll use that a lot when I'm doing probe design and so on. Um, I am not familiar with Volterra kernels, so uh, I'm not sure. And so port numbering obviously can be whatever you want. For the purposes of today's class, we're always going to have port 1 is the tip of the probe and port 2 is at the scope. And so S21 is our forward path, so what the scope sees based on what came in from the device under test. And S11 is our reflected power back into the device under test. And then we're going to pretty much ignore S22 and S12 because the scope is not generating a signal. So the first type of probe that we're going to be looking at is not even really a probe, the direct coaxial connection from uh, the device under test straight into your instrument. So this is kind of the simplest degenerate case of a probe, but it's still, it's, it's useful to look at for the purposes of understanding what we're comparing probes to. Uh, and on that note, a lot of times if you're working with a more low level, entry level scope, it's not going to have a native 50 ohm termination. So there's a couple of different techniques you can use to kind of hack a 50 ohm input onto a scope that only has one meg input. So you'll see two of them here. You can either use an inline terminator as shown on the right, or as shown on the left, uh, you can use a T fitting and then have your signal come in one side of a terminator on the other and then feed that into scope. These, these perform about the same, give or take a bet. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind, though, is that in both cases, your termination is not actually at the scope front end. And so you will have a small unterminated path between the uh, uh, termination and uh, the front end. And so you will have that reflection off the one meg ohm input. So essentially an open circuit as far as the 50 ohm line is concerned. You get a reflection between there and uh, the termination. And so that's what's causing the hump in the rising edge on the left side. And then when we have the match 50 ohm input, then you don't get that. So as you start getting out into, there's, there's a, it's a, it's not as big a deal with the really lower end, you know, 50 megahertz scope and stuff like that. But as you start getting out to scopes that have a couple hundred megahertz of bandwidth, but don't have a native 50 ohm input, you do start to run into artifacts like this. And certainly if for whatever reason you're using a one meg ohm input on a scope that has a 50 ohm mode, and you're trying to do something like this, you, you really should use the native 50 ohm mode if you possibly can. Uh, the other thing to note is that the one meg ohm input is generally going to be lower bandwidth if you've got switchable. So in the example shown here, the scope is only 500 megahertz bandwidth in one meg mode, while it'll do four gigahertz in 50 ohm mode. And so you'll see that the rising edge is a lot slower in the left screenshot. Um, so it really depends what frequencies this would be a concern at. That really depends on the layout of the front end PCB and how long the stub is internally, as well as exactly what sort of termination you're using. The bigger your T is, the further your termination is from the actual front end IC. 
the longer your reflection is, the longer your stub is going to be, and the lower the frequency you're going to start seeing problems at. So, honestly, a good way to check if this is going to be an issue is just to feed a sharp edge from a 50 ohm input through your proposed setup and see what happens. See if you see a nice clean edge or if you start seeing dips and non monotonic edges. Um, all of these rising edges I'm using for pulse response testing are from one of Leo Bodnar's BNC pulse generators. Uh, you can just Google Leo Bodnar BNC pulse generator or something like that. They're like 50 bucks or something like that. Plug into a USB port, generate a uh, 10 megahertz square wave with rise times in the low tens of picoseconds. So pretty much for any instrument with less than like 10 gigahertz of bandwidth or even more than that, you can consider it an ideal infinitely fast step and any delays and artifacts you see on the edges are the fault of your instrument. And so they're great for showing off differences in frequency response and rise time at different setups. And so if you run a signal from one of those things into uh, the uh, scope input, then yeah, you can actually use that to characterize the edges. Um, I went all out on mine. I actually sent it to a calibration lab to get an official traceable spec for rise and fall time. And I think it was like 27, 28 picosecond rise time or something like that. Respect for 40 or well, respect for under 40. Uh, but yeah, certainly doing that kind of testing is the best option. Other than that is really you, you start actually having to look at the edge and it, it, it really is dependent on the, even that's a PCB layout inside the scope is a big issue as far as this. And again, if you're using an inline termination, how long is the distance from the termination resistors to the BNC? And again, that, that depends on the specific hardware in use. So as a general, I would say low hundreds megahertz is kind of the problem range because when you get beyond about 500 meg, you start looking at most things having native 50 ohm inputs and below maybe 75 to 100 meg, most stuff is probably going to be too slow for this to be an issue. In between, it is really hardware dependent. Uh, so uh, overall, the big advantages of the direct coax input, you've got pretty much no additive noise. There's no external amplifiers. There's no external attenuators. You've just got the signal straight into the scope. It's essentially free. You need the cable anyway, and so you don't need any additional probes or accessories or amplifies, etc. Um, and uh, it gives essentially perfect response modulo cable loss, and if you know what your cable is, you can characterize that and uh, de-embed the response of the cable. So for the most part, you can consider a direct coax input to be an ideal, almost perfect input up to, again, uh, once you start getting to a couple of gigahertz, you do have to start paying attention to cable loss, but that's going to be an issue with any kind of a probe that has a cable off of it too. So that's, that's always going to be a problem at those frequencies. The downside is, as mentioned, uh, you do need a native 50 ohm input. You can, again, kind of hack the external termination on for lower bandwidth stuff, and depending on what you're doing, it may or may not end up being good enough. Uh, you also have range considerations, so uh, you're not going to be able to probe anything that is outside the operating range or the DC bias limits of the scope. Uh, and honestly, for most purposes, the biggest limitation of the direct coax input is uh, the heavy loading you are putting a 50 ohm load on your device under test. And so it's essentially you're putting a 50 ohm resistor across it. And very often that's way too much loading and is going to cause problems. Uh, but you can actually get good results uh, using this if, for example, your device under test has coaxial test points. A lot of FPGA dev boards, for example, will have outputs that have direct SMA connections straight to a serial transceiver or something exactly for this purpose. Uh, in general, if you're measuring the end of an unterminated 50 ohm line, so if you've got some kind of a connector that doesn't have anything mated to it, if you can just solder coax directly across the connector, get a mating connector and solder a cable directly across signal and ground on the mating connector, you can get really nice performance and get a very clean measurement right to the socket. Um, and another thing that it is good for is if you're doing a direct uh, input as compared to a probe, if you want to see how much the response changes. So if you're looking at an ideal coaxial input and then you apply a probe in between, you can see, okay, the probe is causing these changes in the signal.
So any questions on the coax input before we move on? I see some spam in the chat. Let me see if I can make that go away. And uh, so the main reason is that typically RF equipment is going to have a 50 ohm input. Um, if you are working with like some audiovisual equipment that uses uh, 75 ohm cables, you could in principle do a 75 ohm cable input, but you're not going to usually see anything much higher than that. Um, in general, there's also there are physical limits as to how high the impedance of a cable can go. Uh, you're not going to see, you know, several hundred ohm cables because they're just not going to be practical to manufacture. Uh, yeah, so 70, 75 ohm coax could theoretically be done. I've, I've never seen a scope of 75 ohm input. I guess if it's something meant to look at, like NTSC video or something like that, that that might be a thing. But certainly, it's not. It's not something that you're going to see mass market and. Uh, so, question, uh, intended audience. So, we are primarily aiming at, at uh, people who have used scopes before, but um, don't necessarily have a detailed understanding of all of the different architectures of probes and all the subtleties of how probes work and how they're built. Uh, some understanding of basic circuit behavior is important. Uh, and next question was, why are there not systems with 1K ohm impedance? Uh, so that starts to get into a bit more of the e &M physics. Uh, um, so the reason there is actually the impedance of free space is 377 ohms, and it's generally not possible to make a transmission line with an impedance any higher than that. So that's kind of a physical limit. And realistically, for most cable geometries, it's hard to get much beyond maybe 100. A, you, you probably could hit 200 ohms if you put enough work into it, but it would be a massive cable with a really thick dielectric and a skinny conductor, and it'd probably have heavy loss and so on. Um, there's also balances as far as both good matching, uh, again, manufacturable geometries and so on. Um, as far as uh, sound card uh, performance for RF input, uh, that is, again, really card specific. Uh, it, it's hard to answer without knowing details of what the input stage is built for. All right, so let's continue on to the next type of probe. So now we're going to look at the classic RC divider probe, the one that pretty much every scope comes with out of the box. And it's an ancient design. It goes back to the vacuum tube era. And uh, as you'll see, it was really good for vacuum tube circuits and is maybe not the best type of probe for uh, more modern designs. So uh, let's look at kind of a simplified schematic of what an RC divider probe actually looks like. So you've got at the tip of the probe, you've got your, say, 9 mega ohm resistor for the classic 10 to 1 design. You've got a capacitor across that. Then at the scope input, you've got a matching resistor and capacitor. And then you've got a compensation capacitor at the BNC terminal. Or in many cases, you've got more than one or even a series resistor and a capacitor. There's a lot of different compensation networks. Um, and, yes, they still make RC divider probes. They're a very common design, and that's why, actually, you'll see I've got, like, 20-plus slides on them because it's such a common design that I do want to go into a lot of detail on it. Um, but it is an old design, and as a result, uh, you'll see it really was optimized for the needs of, like, circuits in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and is not necessarily the best choice for modern applications. Um, the other thing is that the cable is actually usually made to have a fairly high series resistance. Uh, the center conductor is actually usually nichrome or something in order to damp out reflections because if we look, the cable is generally going to be, say, a meter long. Your scope input is almost an open circuit as far as impedance is concerned. And so you are generally going to get a reflection off of the scope. I mean, it's going to start becoming a problem anytime uh, the rise time of your signal has a uh, wavelength longer than, say, a meter, and that's a fairly low frequency. So uh, you'll actually see in some of the screenshots later on, you can actually see this reflection. Even with the loss of cable, it reduces the reflections, but it does not eliminate them entirely. And so once you see it, you'll start seeing it everywhere, and you're not going to be able to unsee it. <laughs> 
And uh, I mentioned compensation briefly, so just to go into a little bit more detail on that. The simplest design is the single variable capacitor I showed there. Very often you'll see, say, a big capacitor and a small one for low and high range. You'll see a series resistor in some cases. Um, the uh, LaCroix passive probes that I have for my main scope have three different compensation adjustments. I don't know off the top of my head uh, how many resistors and capacitors there are and what the actual internal circuit construction looks like, but there are three different adjustments. And so uh, the way that you'll use this is typically the probe manual will include documentation on the order that you're supposed to adjust them. Usually you start with coarse and you move out towards more fine adjustments while using the compensation output on the front of the scope and trying to get the square wave to look as square as possible. Uh, this is typically what you would do if you're trying to optimize for broadband flatness. It is possible if you're working with, say, uh, particular radio applications or something like that, you may decide to adjust the compensation to be very flat in that region, perhaps at the cost of flatness elsewhere. Um, and so, no, the trim cap is not really attenuating the reflections. Um, it's mainly to flatten the frequency response uh, because... Uh, if we go back to the schematic here, what you'll see is the uh, you've got R and C in parallel here and R and C in parallel here. So you've got essentially a resistive voltage divider and a capacitive voltage divider in parallel. And uh, so um, the uh, problem is that the input capacitance of the scope, especially with all the internal parasitics and stuff, is not necessarily going to be exactly constant. And certainly if you move a probe from one instrument to another, this input capacitance is not going to be exactly the same. And so the compensation caps are really there to uh, adjust the ratio of uh, the capacitive divider and the resistive divider so that they match as much as possible so that you get a net flat response. And speaking of which, here's a good example of this. So this is a S21 response measurement of a uh, 500 megahertz LaCroix passive probe. The uh, blue curve is when it's compensated for my 4 gigahertz scope. And uh, the red curve is when it's compensated for the 16 gigahertz scope. And both of these curves were measured on the 16 gig scope. And so you'll see on, even though it was perfect for the other scope, when we move it to this scope, the input stage is a little bit different. And so we'll see that with the wrong compensation, we've got an extra 1.5 dB of peaking over here. We've got uh, a 0.3 dB of dip here. But there is a cost in that when we do the adjustment and we do flatten the response a little bit more, we also see the curve move down over in this three to 400 megahertz range. And so that results in us losing about 30 megahertz of bandwidth to the 3 dB point. And so if you were doing a critical measurement in this three to 400 megahertz band, you might choose to adjust the compensation so that maybe you have a little bit better response here, even if the response in the low band isn't as good. And so it, it, it helps to understand what you're actually doing when you compensate and what kind of measurements you're trying to do. And so, you, again, you, you may find that it's, or especially if you're trying to do, say, accurate uh, voltage measurements of a higher frequency signal, if you can apply a known stimulus and then adjust the compensation to try and get the value to be closer, you can kind of do a little bit more of a calibration for a narrowband measurement. Generally speaking, you know, 95% of the time you're going to be optimizing for broadband flatness, but there are, there are special cases where you might not be. Uh, so another issue to consider that is one of the biggest downsides to the RC divider probe is loading. So a lot of more junior engineers will pick up one of these things and see it says 10 mega ohm impedance, and they assume, okay, this, this thing puts no load on my circuit at all. You know, 10 megs is huge compared to whatever I'm doing. You know, maybe you have a 100K pull-up resistor or something like that, and 10 megs is massive compared to that. Yeah, except you forgot about that capacitance. Uh, question, how was the data measured? Uh, you're actually going to see that about two slides later, so we'll get to that then. So... Uh, the big problem with probe loading is that when you apply your probe to a circuit, you are altering its behavior because fundamentally some of the signal has to leave the device under test and travel through the probe for your scope or other instrument to see it. And this will result in some loss to the signal on the device under test. And potentially if you get reflections or weird artifacts, and again, we'll see some examples of these, uh, you can create what's known as a Heisenberg, where the behavior of the device uh, uh, is altered by the probing to the point that it stops working, 
or I've seen devices where there is a glitch on a signal and the probe loading damps out the glitch so it only works when you're probing it. Uh, it's also possible that you're debugging one issue and as soon as your probe hits a circuit it fails in a different way and you spend a whole bunch of time debugging that only to discover it as a probe and now you're no closer to finding your original bug. Uh, question, uh, when discussing bandwidth, do we determine the 3 dB point is maximum bandwidth or uh, plus or minus 3 dB? So uh, the convention that I'm using and is generally fairly common is you quote from the nominal attenuation to 3 dB below there and you ignore any peaking in the meantime. And so you'll see in some of the plots we're going to see later on that um, the... Uh, peaking can actually be quite significant. So the flatness in that range is not necessarily plus or minus 3 dB. You'll actually see there's some of the, I've seen some probes where I've got 5 plus dB of peaking before you hit the minus 3 dB row off. And uh, actually, no, those measurements were taken with an oscilloscope, and you'll, you'll see why we did that again in a couple of slides. I, just, I wanted to introduce the quick example of the curve before I went into details on how the data was acquired. And So I mentioned this deck was a work in progress, so there is going to be a photo of the probe on a VNA fixture here for doing S11 measurements, and I haven't gotten around to taking the picture yet. So we're just going to pretend there's a picture of the VNA with a probe on it for now. And so this is an example of uh, what the S11 response of an RC divider probe is going to look like across an open circuit. So we're measuring across an open circuit. It should ideally be an ideal open. If we have a large DC resistance and no additional capacitive loading, we should see essentially 0 dB of S11. So all the incident power is reflected back. In practice, of course, we don't see that. We see it because of the capacitance. We see the loading of the circuit is gradually increased, so the probe is presenting a lower and lower resistance as the frequency goes up. And then as we hit around 420-ish megahertz, we see this resonant dip right here. And at this point, the inductance of the probe starts to dominate, and it starts to get higher again. So this is, this is kind of, if you ever looked at the uh, impedance of a capacitor across frequency, this is pretty much a textbook example of that, where you've got the capacitance dominating and the impedance is dropping, and then uh, the inductance starts to dominate and the impedance starts to go up. And so we're looking at this from an S11 perspective, but um, again, it's, it's essentially the same thing. And so this probe only has 500 megahertz of bandwidth, but I included the plot out to a gigahertz just to illustrate how the inductance starts to dominate at this point. And that is one of the reasons that the probe is a 500 megahertz probe is because once the inductance starts to take over, then you start to lose bandwidth rapidly. So uh, now we're going to look at time domain loading of an RC divider probe. And so the setup that we have for this is pretty straightforward. We've got, uh, this is uh, the fast rise time pulse generator I had mentioned previously. So it takes a USB power in. It's got a trigger port out that we're not using. Generates the fast edge and we feed that into a test fixture. This is actually a LaCroix probe d -skew fixture that I've been using a lot for some of these demos. And so we've got a 50 ohm through line here with an SMA on each end. We feed the output of that right into the scope. And so that this is this line coming off to the right. This is what uh, S11 is the reflected power. So uh, the uh, okay, sorry, uh, losing track of what's port one, parts two. So convention for this lecture is that port one is the device under test on the, so the tip side of the probe, and port two is the scope. So uh, S11 is reflected power back to the device under test. S21 is the signal seen by the scope, and we're ignoring the other two parameters. Uh, all right, so... Anyway, the output coming off of here, so we've got our signal coming in here, it goes through the through line, we put our probe across the through line, and then coming out to the scope, we have the output of this line. And so our scope is presenting a 50 ohm load to the end of the through line, and what the scope sees is if this were a real piece of hardware, that is on channel 2, that is what the device under test would see with no probe attached. And then if we put our probe across, we can see the signal on channel 2 be altered, and the change from the original signal to the signal with the probe present tells us how much of a distortion the probe introduced. And so now here's a long shot of the setup. So again, you can see the probe is not on the circuit right now. We've got port uh, two of the scope is going to the output of our test fixture, and then our probe is on channel one. 
So here's our baseline measurement with uh, no probe on the board. So we've got our fast edge going through. It's about plus or minus 400 millivolts. Uh, and uh, we've got the uh, dark pink line is what the device under test is seeing as is. And then the light pink is uh, a saved copy of that signal. And so right now they're the same because we don't have a probe on the board. And as we add a probe, you'll start seeing the memory trace and the real-time trace are going to start diverging. And again, the divergence between them gives you a time domain view of the probe's loading. So now here we are with the probe on the board. We're using a 10 meg RC divider probe, 10 to one. And uh, you may be a little bit surprised at how much of a change there is. So the probe sees the yellow signal, so it's, it's delayed. I didn't do any de-skewing, so we're seeing this delay is the difference in cable length between the blue cable on the bench and the probe cable. And uh, then uh, the rise time is a little bit lower. There's a little bit of overshoot and ringing. But more importantly, we're seeing right here, there's this big dip where the signal rises almost to its final amplitude. Uh, yes, the through line is the device center test. So the signal rises, gets almost to the final amplitude, then dips, then starts rising again. So now imagine what would happen if this was a clock signal and your switching threshold was right here. You're getting double clocks. I have actually, uh, the reason I originally came up with this uh, demo is a coworker not too long ago was working on a flash memory device and when they put a probe on the clock signal, the memory actually ended up getting corrupted and the best guess that I was able to come up with is that the probe loading caused glitches on the clock signal, which as it was writing data to flash, caused uh, the data to be bit shifted because it was reading some bits more than once and then the entire spy transaction got corrupted. So this is a real problem that can cause significant issues to the functionality of the device under test. Uh, on that note, when I'm teaching this class in person with a lab component, um, one of the things in the lab is going to be an example of this effect. So I'm going to try and come up with a device that has a comparator-based switching input that is driven by a square wave and does a frequency count or toggle or something like that. And uh, you'll actually see when you put the probe on the device under test, it will create this double clocking effect and you'll see the signal start toggling at twice the rate it should and so on. Uh, so I haven't actually designed the board for that, but that is, that, that is definitely going to be one of the demos in the lab. Uh, so here's another good example. This is a pure tone uh, in a high impedance state. So we've got uh, essentially an open circuit. I'm using a very high impedance active probe to measure the signal instead of a 50 ohm input to the scope. And then I add the RC divider probe. This is at about 420-ish megahertz, which is right about the resonant frequency of this probe where it hits the lowest impedance. And we can see our 860-some millivolt input drop down to 327 millivolts. So this is something like minus 9 or so dB of S11. So you're losing the majority of your amplitude to the probe. So if you're probing some sensitive RF signal, something like that, you could be taking an already weak signal and pushing it over the edge to the point that the receiver won't even see it. Uh, question, are there logic families that are resilient to probing like this? Um, I mean, if your edges are really slow, then uh, it's not as big a deal. But fundamentally, uh, when you are adding a large capacitive load to a signal, there's not really much you can do about that. The proper solution is to use a probe that doesn't have as much input capacitance. So another thing to consider with the RC divider probe and kind of the key in getting the best performance out of it is to be aware of the input is extremely capacitive. But again, if you're running in X1 mode, if you've got switchable 10X, 1X probes, it's even worse. But we're, we're going to focus on the 10X mode because generally 95% of the time you're going to be using the 10X mode. Uh, most of the higher end probes don't even have a 1X mode. 
And so the input is very capacitive. And so what this means is that if you start adding inductance in there, now you're stimulating a LC tank circuit, and it's going to start resonating and ringing. And so if you're using a long wire ground, like, you know, the one with the alligator clip that everybody gets started with, uh, you start to see problems. And as a general rule, there's kind of a trade-off of convenience and performance. So as you're using accessories that give you more ergonomics, more freedom for moving the probe around the board, uh, easier usage and not having to, you know, pay really close attention to where you're putting the ground leads, you're generally going to get worse performance. So things like the alligator clip, for example, yeah, it's super convenient. It's great for low frequency work, but it's got massive inductance. And as long as you're aware of that, and as long as you are looking at signals where the frequency is low enough that this isn't a huge deal and you stay away from the resonances, it's not as big a problem. But uh, you'll see in some of the graphs here that you can get substantial errors when you start measuring closer to these resonances. And then uh, you've got, obviously, on the other side is the spring ground, where you've got pretty much a fixed spacing of signal to ground. You have to find a ground in that general vicinity. Uh, if you're not careful, they'll spring off of whatever via our connector pin you put the ground on and short to something else. They're, they're a huge pain in the neck to use, but they do give the best performance from an inductance perspective. And I didn't put it in the uh, slides, but also you can have a coaxial probe socket, which is... It's kind of a niche thing you're not going to find yourself using too often, but that is pretty much the ideal as far as best possible and doc dense, uh, best possible bandwidth out of an RC divider probe. Uh, and then obviously uh, there's intermediate ground accessories. Uh, one of them that I don't have a photo of, but I'll be uh, showing off in the lab is uh, what I've seen called the Z ground. It's kind of a angled zigzag shaped piece of stiff wire that uh, is uh, uh, inserted into a socket on the probe that it, it wraps around the probe body much like uh, the conventional alligator clip ground, but it's got a uh, pin header socket and you've got the stiff Z-shaped wire coming out of it. And so by rotating the wire in the socket, you can adjust the spacing from the ground needle to the probe needle. Uh, because of the extra wire length, this is more inductive than a spring ground, but since it does have adjustable spacing and is less springy, I find it a lot more easy to use, again, for, for mid-band applications where you maybe don't quite need the performance of a spring ground, but is a lot easier to use than the alligator clip. And so, again, there, there, there's always this trade-off, and you just have to be aware of the fact that you are adding inductance, you are shifting that resonance to lower and lower frequencies, and depending on what you're measuring, that may or may not be acceptable. So uh, now we're going to start getting to uh, the question people were asking about how some of these S-parameter curves came from. So for S11, your reflected signal going back to the device under test is straightforward. You use a VNA, you stick it on a fixture, you basically create a uh, open circuit line. We've just got a say an SMA connector, a short length of transmission line. You land the probe on the end of that line. You do uh, a reference plane shift uh, to adjust the reference plane of your measurement to the tip of that wire. And now you're measuring the reflected power from the probe. That's that's straightforward. It's easy. You can do this with pretty much any kind of probe under the side. Uh, and again, we don't really care about S22 and S12 because uh, the scope is not supposed to be generating signals. If you have your scope driving signals out of the BNC inputs, you've got really big problems and your scope is probably on fire. Uh, the S21 pass is where you start to get problems because for transmission line probes and a few other kinds of probes, you can actually just stick it on a VNA and be done with it. But if your probe does not have a 50 ohm output, you can't really use a VNA easily. So consider the case of uh, an RC divider probe where you've got a 10 mega ohm output. There's not really a good way to get that onto uh, the uh, VNA and get useful data out of it. And if you've got an active probe, you start running into problems where the active probe needs to be powered. It needs to have gain and offset adjustments and things like that. And again, there's not really a good way to do that while it's on a VNA. The vendors sometimes have, for factory calibration stuff, they may have a fixture that will supply power and control signals to the probe. Uh, but uh, these are very expensive and in some cases not even available out to the vendor. They may only sell them to, you know, their calibration partner labs and stuff like that. So if you're just trying to do research on probe flatness, it's difficult. Um, the other thing to consider is that a lot of times the scope will actually do some DSP flatness correction internally. So, uh, for example, the uh, LaCroix Wavelength Differential Probes will actually have an EEPROM in the probe amplifier. 
that stores some kind of, I don't know if it's actually a touchstone as parameter file or if it's uh, far filter coefficients, but it's, it stores some sort of data that is calibrated to that specific probe for correcting response flatness of that probe. And so when you plug the probe into your scope, you are not actually seeing the native response of the probe amplifier. You are seeing the combined response of the probe amplifier, the scope front end, and the DSP corrections done in the scope. And as an end user, if you are trying to understand the performance of the probe in your system and how accurate your measurements are at a given frequency, you care about the end-to-end -end system response. You don't necessarily care about the response of one portion of the system. And so for all these reasons, trying to measure the S21 response of a probe is not a straightforward task. And so the solution that I came up with after a bunch of experimenting was to create what I can best describe as a mixed signal VNA. It is a VNA in which port 1 is an analog 50 ohm input and port 2 is digitized waveform samples. And so the way this is done is uh, by using the actual scope that you are trying to use the data for as a direct RF sampling receiver for the S21 path. So you apply a tone to the probe tip, you digitize the waveform as seen by the probe, and you compare the net response across that path. And in order to uh, correct for things like we don't necessarily know the exact amplitude of the stimulus signal, we don't necessarily know the exact phase of the stimulus signal. So the way we get around this is by using a splitter. So the signal comes off our generator. It goes through a splitter. One path of this is essentially the internal feedback from what you would normally see in a VNA inside going from the splitter to one part of the scope that you call your reference. And the other path travels to your test fixture through your probe into your scope, and then you compare the ratiometric phase and amplitude of the signal as seen by the scope. So in uh, my case, I will do a digital down conversion by, in DSP, taking the full bandwidth mixed signal, or the full bandwidth digitized waveform, mixing it with a sine and cosine at some frequency close but not exactly equal to the incident signal, and then measuring the IQ phase and amplitude of that as compared to the other signal. And so here's what this actually looks like as a uh, GeoScope client filter graph. Um, I'm not actually using GeoScope client in the scope VN application. It's actually a headless application that creates the same filter graph in a console and then spits a touchstone file out to STD out and stuff like that. But anyway, we've got our probe coming in here. We've got a reference coming in here. In this case, we're using 200 megahertz uh, stimulus frequency. So we down convert to a 50 megahertz IF. So we take our 200 megahertz signal, we mix it with 150 megahertz. Uh, and so uh, that will down convert our signal to a 50 megahertz IF. Then we do a far filter with, in this case, 10 megahertz above and below the IF uh, filter uh, bandpass on it. We separately bandpass I and Q to get the IF, and then we do a vector phase and vector magnitude operations to get the phase versus time and uh, magnitude versus time of the IQ signals coming off of the probe and the reference. And then all we have to do is divide the magnitude coming off the probe by the reference magnitude, subtract the reference phase from the probe phase, and this gives us our S21 magnitude and phase. So here's an example of actual data coming off of it. So we've got our tone coming in on our reference signal. We've got the tone coming out of the probe. We can see the signal is a little bit weaker. And if we look at, uh, we've got the IQ signals here. We can then go do our math and we see the probe phase is here, the reference phase is here. And so that comes out to what is this, like a minus 260 some degree phase shift over here and a insertion loss of about 7.1 dB. And we can see the S21 magnitude and phase curves are fairly flat. So these are essentially every set of scope measurements, uh, every point in the incoming scope waveform gives us an S21 magnitude and phase. And so we can average these across the entire acquisition to get lower noise data.
So here's a photo of the actual measurement setup. So uh, this is a slightly earlier iteration of the setup than I used for the example. This is actually, uh, this is before I got the uh, sig vector signal generator I'm using now. So I was using the tone output from my VNA, which has a manual signal generator mode. The problem is that it doesn't have an API, so I had to manually use the VNA software to set the, uh, the CW output frequency take one measurement and so on. So I was able to write the software off of this, but then I waited until I got the actual signal generator for the real thing. And then I had an actual API I could use to program sweeps. Uh, but in any case, you can see we've got our test signals coming out from our tone generator. We've got one leg of the splitter is going into the scope. The other leg is going into our fixture. And then from the fixture, we go through our probe to the scope. And uh, the uh, two channels coming off of the splitter are Roughly equal length identical cables. Uh, they don't need to be, you know, super expensive uh, phase match cables because we can do a calibration by taking both outputs of the splitter, putting them on the scope, taking a measurement of that, and this is essentially a through calibration, which gives us, or a known through calibration, I should say, which should ideally have zero insertion loss and zero phase shift. And so we can take any measured phase error and any measured uh, loss. And this is due to either mismatch in the response curves of the scope front end or mismatch in the splitter where one leg is not quite balanced to the other or mismatch in the cables. We don't necessarily know or care exactly where the source of errors are. We don't really need to know because we've got the combination of all of that errors and we can then essentially de-embed that S21 measurement from the measurements we take later on and as long as we're using the same scope configuration, the same gain and so on, then we can correct for all of that. Uh, there is going to be some shifts if, for example, you change the gain of the scope front end, the response of the scope front end is going to change a little bit. And so you're going to start insert, uh, you're going to start adding errors to your measurements. So ideally, you want to take the measurements with scope settings that are as close. You want to take the calibration with scope settings that are as close as possible to your final measurement. But uh, again, there, there's really not any better way I could find to get S parameters of a one mega ohm probe. So here's an example of uh, what the S21 of this probe, this is a Teledon the Croy PP022, which is the standard probe that ships with the WaveRunner 8000 series scopes, um, measured with the spring ground. And so you'll note that we start with minus 1 dB of insertion loss, so we actually have a slight magnitude error even at DC, or near DC. It dips down to about two and a half dB down, and then all of a sudden, wait a minute, we're up at one dB, two, two and a half dB of uh, peaking up at 320 some megahertz, and then it starts to free fall down here. We start to hit three dB uh, down at around 400 megahertz, and so this is with a spring ground. This is on a pretty good setup. And uh, to be fair, this is, I am not de-embedding the insertion loss of the actual fixture, the LaCroix PCF200 test fixture. So there's a small amount of insertion loss in that SMA connector transition and the intercellular transmission line that I'm measuring. But, you know, it's not going to be 10 dB of insertion loss. It's maybe half a dB of insertion loss on the fixture. And so if I really wanted to get super precise measurements, I could try and actually characterize the loss of the fixture and de-embed that. But again, for further purposes of illustrating the differences in probe performance, it's not really necessary because we're comparing one probe against another on the same fixture. Uh, anyway, so you can see in this case, we actually only hit 400 megahertz bandwidth on a probe labeled for 500 meg. And so I found it is generally fairly hard to actually hit the spec bandwidth for most probes on any kind of a remotely real world scenario. Like if you don't put the probe into a coaxial socket with perfect grounding and everything, you're going to have a hard time actually hitting the spec bandwidth. So keep that in mind. I mean, it's, it still is usable to 500 megahertz if you don't mind, you know, your measurement being 9 dB down from where it's supposed to be. And so now here we are with the alligator clip ground just a little bit less pretty. So someone in the audience was asking earlier about uh, measuring flatness. Yeah, so here we are with the alligator clip on a 500 megahertz probe. We hit minus 3 dB at 76 megahertz. At 150 megahertz, we're at plus 5 dB, so we're measuring 78% over the actual applied voltage. And we get down to 300 megahertz-ish, we're 25 dB down. <laughs> and this is on a probe for 500 megahertz. 
So just because it says 500 megahertz on the probe does not mean it will give you 500 megahertz of 3db bandwidth in a realistic situation even if being used correctly with good grounding and if your grounding is less than ideal yeah you're not going to get 500 meg or even close to it so just for comparison's sake here's both of those curves in the same scale i'll just let this sink in for a minute <laughs> And uh, now let's take a look at what the time domain response of these probes looks like. So here is the same fast rise pulse generator being applied to the probe with the spring ground. So we can see there's a little bit of overshoot because even the spring ground has some endocrines and you still do get a little bit of that LC resonance. And so if we drop off back to here, you'll see around 300 megahertz, there is a small peak. It's only about two, it's only about two and a half dB. But uh, that 2.5 dB is still there, and so you can see that's causing this little bit of a peak right here. And then we start seeing it gets reasonably flat, and there's just this little bit of a dip. Again, it's hard to see. It, it helps if you, have, if you adjust the vertical scale to really max out the range and if you really look closely, but especially if you turn on persistence motor, if you do equivalent time sampling to try and get the last little bits of uh, sensitivity out you will actually see a little bit of a dip at 13 nanoseconds. And if you do the math for about a velocity factor of 0.65 or so for a typical coaxial cable and the one-ish meter probe length, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a reflection coming off that one mega ohm scope input going back through the lossy nichrome cable. And again, it is lossy, but it is not infinite lossy because you have to get the signal through it one way. And so when the reflection comes out and back, then you will actually still see that. And so you'll start seeing this in all your measurements from now on once you start looking at this. So now here's the same probe on the same fixture with the alligator clap. A little bit worse. So we can see we've got massive overshoot here. Again, we're, we're now at 5 dB of uh, peaking at our 160 megahertz there. So this is the 16th harmonic of the fundamental of our 10 megahertz square wave. Our 16th harmonic is uh, bumped up 5 dB from where it should be, so almost double the amplitude. And again, we can see that here where we're going from 400 uh, millivolts nominal all the way up to 700 or so over here. And then we get a ton of ring, and it just starts to stabilize. And then we get the falling edge, and same thing happens on the other side. <laughs> and so I thought this was another interesting uh, comparison. So this is uh, the $10 probe from the opening slide compared to the $345 LaCroix probe that uh, we've been looking at during most of this section. And you'll notice that even though the other probe costs 34 times less than the LaCroix probe, right here, where they cross down to 3dB, yeah, the bandwidth is like 1 megahertz difference, or not even. And, uh, yeah, you know, there's some slight differences in flatness, but it's not really that significant. So for the most part, with the alligator clip, these probes perform about the same. So it doesn't matter how much you spend on the probe. If you've got an RC divider probe and you're not using a good ground on it, yeah, your $10 probe is not going to perform any worse because you just destroyed the performance of your expensive probe. And just to continue down this line of thought, the cheap probe does not come with a low inductance ground at all. So you're stuck using the alligator clip if you just use it out of the box. And obviously they're targeting novice users with less nice equipment uh, who don't understand the benefits of this. And so they build this thing as a 200 megahertz probe. It is physically impossible to get 200 megahertz bandwidth out of that thing with the grounding accessories they provide because uh, they don't give you any kind of a low inductance ground. And so I hacked up a low inductance ground of my own using some 22 gauge wire and uh, a piece of capped on tape and it took a couple of tries i initially tried using copper foil tape and i had problems getting good performance out of it and so i just tried kind of twisting this wire around the probe and then literally taping it in place with capped on tape and so you can see the difference in bandwidth is not actually that much 
and it's actually a little bit flatter of this. The uh, red trace here it was the uh, LaCroix probe before I compensated for the scope, and so once I compensated it, the performance is going to be a little bit closer, and so honestly, the performance of these two is very similar. So fundamentally, the RC divider probe architecture, again, it's a decades-old design. It's already been optimized to hell and back. There's not really too much you can do to tweak it. And so when you're buying nicer probes, you're not really necessarily buying better performance with the RC divider architecture. What you're actually getting is better ergonomics, better accessories. You're getting more adjustments to get the flattest performance when you're compensating it. You get the little resistor and the pin that let the scope automatically tell you're in 10x mode and you plug it in. You don't have to hack up the spring ground yourself. And so certainly it's also – they're also – better built mechanically, you know, it'll probably last longer, they've got better strain relief in the cables, all kinds of little things like that. So, yeah, if you're using it with an expensive scope and you're doing a ton of critical measurements, yeah, you're probably better off getting the nice pro. But for the average hobbyist, you know, the cheap probe is actually not that bad. Now, I, I was surprised. I did this experiment expecting it to be absolute garbage, and, you know, like, they didn't even trim the mold flash off of the plastic when they molded the thing, and then electrically, the performance is surprisingly good. So, yeah, this is a great example of how uh, the uh, uh, RC divider probe architecture really doesn't have much variation in performance between cheap and expensive probes. And you'll see as we get later on for other kinds of probe, that's not the case, and you do actually get better performance with more expensive probes. So now let's recap this section. So the biggest benefit of the RC divider probe is what it was originally designed for. It was meant for probing grid voltages on vacuum tube circuits, which were very high voltage and very low drive strength. And so the very low DC resistive loading was a great benefit for that. And they're cheap. I mean, you just saw I was showing off a $10 probe. It performs great. Even the really fancy ones from LaCroix are two, 300 bucks. They're a generic portable design. They work with pretty much any scope. And they're, I won't say indestructible, but I don't think I've ever heard a case of someone damaging an RC divider probe with any reasonable amount of overload. You know, you, they're almost invulnerable to ESD and so on because it's just a resistor and a capacitor. There's no active components. There's no transistors. There's uh, no super sensitive stuff in there. It's not like, you know, the fancy active differential probes that have unprotected SIGI front ends on them that have... Uh, super tiny transistors meant to toggle at 25 gigahertz and all kinds of stuff like that. So these probes are, they're, they're fairly robust. Uh, the big downside is, again, you got relatively limited bandwidth. You only get a couple hundred megahertz, uh, if that. Uh, your input capacitance is going to result in heavy loading. Any inductance of the ground path whatsoever is going to severely degrade your performance. And again, the lower your inductance goes, the more awkward it gets to actually use the probe. And you've also got high attenuation, which is a problem if you're trying to get a really weak signal. You've, you've taken your already weak signal and divided it down by another 10, so now you have to make up for that by turning up the gain in your scope front end. And that's going to add noise. And so... Uh, when you want to use one of these probes? Well, if you've got relatively high voltage, low frequency analog stuff, they're great. Again, they were designed for vacuum tube systems. If you're debugging vacuum tube circuits, they're a great choice. Um, if you're working with anything that's outside the voltage range of a typical active probe. So uh, I've got one active probe that goes up to 12 volts DC offset, and that's unusually high for an active probe. Most of them don't go that far. Uh, resistive probes typically get, again, thermally limited. When your voltage gets too high, you start pulling too much current, and you start to run into problems. Um, they're great for classroom usage and starting out and training new engineers because, again, they're cheap to replace if somebody does manage to break them, and again, they're, they're difficult to break. So they're great for training people on, and if you have limited budget and can't afford anything nicer, you know, they, they get the job done some of the time, usually. Any questions before we move on to the next section? All right, so next is the resistive probe. And this is the other passive probe design. When people say passive probe, everyone thinks of the RC divider. Well, guess what? There's another kind of passive probe that uh, a lot of people tend to forget exists. And uh, it really, I think it deserves more love than it gets. It's a really nice architecture that is really good for a lot of applications, actually. It's super simple from a conceptual perspective. It's a resistor and a piece of coax. It's, it's hard to get simpler than that. It's, it's actually got less components than an RC divider probe. 
and you'll see these referred to by a bunch of names. You'll see them called transmission line probes, low Z probes, ZL probes, resistive probes. They're, they all mean the same thing. And so here's the schematic of a resistive probe. You've got a series resistor between your probe tip and a 50 ohm transmission line. You've got your scope configured with a 50 ohm termination across the front end. And these form voltage dividers. So in this case, we've got 450 plus 50 is 500. 500 into 50 gives 10 to 1 attenuation. So you're looking at a 500 ohm DC loading to the device center test and 10 to 1 division. Uh, and there's, again, a linear trade-off between the attenuation of the probe and the loading. So you can make this resistor bigger, you can get less loading at the cost of higher attenuation. So the most common values you'll see here are 450 and 950, giving you 10x and 20x. Uh, I have seen 5x, I've seen, uh, I don't know if I've seen bigger than 20x, that you start to, again, run into noise issues in the front end from having the gain up too high in your scope front end if you do that. Um, and also what you'll see in some designs is you'll see an extra termination resistor at the uh, probe tip side of, or at the handpiece end past the, the damping resistor here. And uh, the purpose of this is, uh, if you remember from uh, uh, the RC divider probe, how you get reflections off of the high impedance scope front end, you don't get that as much with a transmission line design because you've got a 50 ohm termination here and 50 ohm coax. But the return loss of a scope input is actually usually not that great. The broadband S11 curve is not as flat as you would expect. I think the tolerances are usually like 50 ohms plus or minus like 2% is the DC resistance. And then uh, the RF performance, you know, again, it's not going to be a purely resistive input. There's going to be some reactive component as well due to parasitics. And so you will still get a little bit of reflection off there. You know, maybe 15, 20 dB down, but there's going to be some reflection. And so if you put this extra resistor here, you completely attenuate that reflection and you don't get it going back into the scope. The cost is you're doubling your attenuation. So some probes you'll see will have this, some won't. Uh, some of the Pico probes I'm showing actually come in a whole, they have a whole line with a different range of configurations. They, they come in, I think, 5, 10, 20 X attenuation, AC or DC coupled, and uh, uh, with and without the source terminator. So there's, there's a lot of different permutations of this architecture. And uh, actually speaking of which, yeah, you can put an AC coupling capacitor in here if you want to have an AC coupled probe. Since most scopes do not have an AC 50 ohm input mode, they only have a DC coupled 50 ohm input. So uh, these probes obviously have a much higher DC loading than an RC divider. You've got, say, in the most common case, 500 ohms loading rather than 10 mega ohms. But the advantage is that because you don't deliberately add capacitance, you've in theory, got zero capacitance, and so your S21 and S11 curves should be straight lines. Well, of course, parasitics are going to ruin our fun, so it's never going to be quite flat, but it's, it's going to be a lot flatter than most of the alternatives. So here's a few examples of some resistive probes that I have in my lab. So this is one of the Pico ones that I mentioned had the source terminator. This particular one is 20x attenuation and AC coupled. Uh, they also make DC coupled versions. Again, they make 10 to 1 and 5 to 1 versions. This one is, uh, I think it's 515 ohms uh, DC loading and uh, is AC coupled. Uh, and again, has the source terminator. And then we've got the Pico TAO61, which is actually, it's a rebranded PMK probe. I don't remember what the PMK part number is, but it's, it's out there. You can get these. I mean, they're, it's a generic SMA or BNC output. You can use it with any scope. Um, this is one of the cheaper ones. They actually, they, they bumped the price up. It used to be 330 something. Um, they claim one and a half gigahertz of bandwidth. It's, it's a little tricky to get that, but certainly it is, it looks like a regular passive probe. It's got the ergonomics of one and, uh, it's actually a halfway decent probe if you don't mind the poor flatness. And then meanwhile, these guys have excellent performance. And again, you'll see some graphs of this later on. And then we get to this little oddball down here, the LaCroix PPO66. It actually, the, the tip is swappable. It's got a little threaded collar that you can unscrew and put one of several different tips on it. And it gives you great performance. They claim seven and a half gigahertz of bandwidth, but yeah, more spam. Let me go delete that. Um, so uh, the PPO66 has uh, great electrical performance, 
But look at the ergonomics of this thing. It's literally an SMA connector with a ground pin bolted onto the side of it. Like imagine trying to hold this thing and take measurements with it. Or worse yet, imagine trying to put it in any kind of a probe holder to do long-term measurements. It's, it's really awkward to use. I don't use it much. I honestly bought it mostly, I bought it as a refurb, mostly to benchmark some of the other probes against and just to see, you know, okay, what is the kind of the, one of the best transmission line probes on the commercial market. And again, it has pretty good electrical performance, but the ergonomics are lacking. And then we get to the uh, Pico Connect probe here, where the grounds are these two pins at a fixed distance from the signal. So you better have your ground exactly that far away from your signal. There is no adjustment. There is no room for modification or bending or anything. They are pogo pins, so you got a little bit of Z-axis compliance, but there is no left-right adjustment capability whatsoever. And so these are great for looking at like coplanar waveguides or RF circuits where your whole top layer is a bare ground pore or something like that. But honestly, I find it very difficult to take real measurements on a real board with this particular probe because the dimensions of the tip, again, are it's, it's awkward to actually try and get it on a board and get the ground and single contacts to mate at once. So that's one spot that actually both of the other probes are good at. So now we start to get to the advantages of the resistor probe. So we're looking at S11 of the Pico Connect probe versus the RC divider probe. And so we can see that the RC divider probe has that big, we're looking at the two gigahertz now. We've got that big capacitive dip, and then we start to get the inductive rising past the usual bandwidth of the probe. But then our resistive probe, yeah, sure, at DC, the uh, loading is quite a bit higher. But it's at this view, it's basically a straight line. And so starting at 100 megahertz, this 500 ohm probe has lower loading than the 1 mega ohm probe. And we can zoom in a little bit more, and we can see, again, we start out at very low loading, the resistive probe stays pretty much flat. The RC divider probe falls off. And yeah, around uh, 110-ish, 105 megahertz, we hit the crossover. And then the resistive probe actually has lower loading. And so we'll see in some of the time domain loading measurements how the resistive probe actually, in many cases, will load your circuit down less than the one mega ohm probe. And you will see significant differences in flatness between different models of resistive probe. So... In this case, we're looking at, we're comparing the 1.5 gigahertz Pico probe with the uh, 6 gigahertz, the Pico Connect 921. And so you can see both of them kind of have the same general shape where it's flat for a while, then you get a little bit of peaking and then roll off. But this one is a lot worse. And so the, there's a couple different effects going on that I'll get into later on. But it is important to note there is a lot of peaking here, and we'll see that in some of the time domain plots. You'll see how you, you do get some overshoot, you do get uh, a little bit of ringing from that, because there is still some input capacitance. And so let's look at a little bit of the effects as to what's causing some of the flatness issues. So the first one is uh, we're going to look at how a typical chip resistor is built. So your average bog standard 0402 resistor you go buy in a tape of, you know, a thousand of them on DigiKey for $2 or whatever they go for now. You've got your block of ceramic substrate. Usually it's aluminum oxide or something along those lines. You've got your solder terminals at the end, and then you've got a thin film of nichrome, or sometimes it'll be something more exotic like ruthenium oxide or something like that. Uh, that is your actual resistive element. And so it's, it's, it's straightforward. This is basically how you would expect a resistor to look if it was built on a ceramic substrate. And then you've got, you know, your board is in the bottom and you solder to these terminals. So it's all good. Well, let's think about this from a slightly different perspective. You've got two parallel plates of conductor. You've got a dielectric between them. And you've got a resistive leakage path. I'll just let you think about this for a minute. <laughs> yeah, it's a capacitor. So an actual real resistor is going to have some inductance from the mounting, which is generally not as big a deal, but um, at, since your signal has to go from the board up down this, you've got this long-ish wire, and so there is some L coming in from here. And then you've got the shunt capacitance, 
between the two terminals, and then you've got your desired resistance in parallel with that. And obviously you can extend this to higher order models that aren't just a simple, you know, one R, one L, one C, but this is kind of a simple, straightforward example. And so typical surface mount resistors are going to have this shunt capacitance V in the tens, maybe low hundreds of femtofarads, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you start to get out to gigahertz frequencies, it, it the actual behavior of the circuit starts to be significantly affected by this and uh, your reactance of this capacitor is going to be the same order magnitude as your resistance in a lot of cases and as frequency increases you start to get to the point where more of your signal goes through this capacitor around your resistor than through the resistor so here's an example this is this is from a uh, fairly nice rf resistor too it's a 200 ohm vishay fco 402 and so we can see uh, about 11 gig yeah about 11 gigahertz uh, our 200 ohm resistor is actually closer to 100 ohms. At 20 gigahertz, it's below 50. And so, depending on how high grade the resistors are and how much effort the probe designer has put into compensating for these effects, you can start to get significant uh, peaking at higher frequencies due to this. And so that's why you've seen a lot of these probes. You'll see uh, you've got a mostly flat area. You can start to get a peaking area where the capacitance of uh, the resistor starts to dominate, and then inductance and, uh, and losses in the system start to take over, and then you start seeing roll-off. So one of the things that you can see used to compensate for this is flip chip resistor. This is actually a screenshot of an EM solver model I made of one of the FCO402 resistors, where you've got your ceramic substrate and your resistive element printed on the bottom of it, and then you've just got these thin film contacts with your conductors going right up to it, and you don't actually have uh, any vertical path. You don't have your resistive element on the top. It's all on the bottom, and so it's basically a straight-through path. So because you've got much less capacitance in the resistive probe than uh, the RC divider probe, you have lower capacitive loading on your circuit, and you can also generally see a lot less ringing, or alternatively, if you're willing to accept the same level of ringing, you can put a lot more inductance in the ground path. And so your input capacitance is going to be anywhere in the low picofarads to the hundreds of femtofarads. So just to give you a comparison, here's that 1.5 gigahertz pico probe with the alligator clip ground and the spring ground. So you'll see with the alligator clip ground, looking at this 10 megahertz pulse, you know, yeah, it's, there's, there's still some d distortion on the edge here. There's a little bit of a dip there. There's still some ringing, but it's not that horrible. So now we're going to look at the same probe with the alligator clip now compared to the RC divider probe. Notice how much more ringing there is with the RC divider probe because the input capacitance is so much higher. So this is about a 10 picofarad input capacitance. This is about a 2 picofarad input capacitance, and we're looking at about the same inductance on the ground lead. And now here we see with the spring ground, we can see that we don't have that little dip there caused by the uh, 1 mega ohm input not being perfectly matched. We have pretty much straight line here. We do have a little bit more overshoot again because this probe does have some of that capacitive peaking across the uh, shunt path of the resistor. Um, but we can see with the spring ground, we get a nice straight edge. And so now this is the interesting comparison. Now we're looking at uh, the uh, RC divider probe with the spring ground versus the resistive probe with the alligator clip ground. It's a little bit worse, but it's not that much worse. And so this is kind of one of the biggest advantages, in my opinion, of the RC divider, or sorry, of the resistive probes for low to mid frequency work is you can get away with using the alligator clip ground at frequencies that with an RC divider probe you would typically have to use the spring ground. So you can get much better ergonomics, it's much easier to move around and quickly probe a bunch of test points, and you can still get good enough flatness for a lot of applications this way. So everybody talks about transmission line probes, or when they're talking about transmission line probes, usually the benefit that they're talking about is lower loading, which is true, and they're talking about increased bandwidth, which is true. But this is kind of one of the underappreciated benefits of uh, the resistive probe architecture, is it lets you get away with sloppier grounding and still being able to get usable enough results.
spam. Let's get rid of that. So another thing to take into account with, I mean, this is an issue with all probes, but generally most of the lower frequency probes don't uh, care about this because you're not working at frequencies high enough for this to become a problem. Uh, the resistive probes are going to typically operate out into the multiple gigahertz. And so the distance from the probe tip to the resistor starts to become a problem because you've got a relatively low impedance stub. So uh, you've got, you know, maybe... 100, 200 ohm or so impedance for your uh, signal needle next to a ground needle as essentially two parallel wire conductors. And so you will get a reflection off of your resistor that goes back down the needle into your device center test with a phase shift from the electrical length of the needle. And so you will get a quarter wave null when the probe needle is a quarter wavelength long. And as you make the needle longer, you are moving that null to lower and lower frequencies. And obviously, also this it's not just the needle. It also uh, applies to the uh, socket that the needle slides into, because most of these, the needle's not soldered to the board. Normally, it's going to be in some kind of a socket, so you can replace it if you bend the tip or something. And there's also going to be some path length on the PCB inside the probe itself from the needle to the first resistor. And that total path length... Uh, when that is a quarter wavelength long, you're going to start to see a big null. And so here's S11 of the 1.5 gigahertz Pico probe versus the 6 gigahertz Pico probe. And the one with the shorter tip still has the same null, but it's at a much higher frequency. We haven't even hit it at the 6 gigahertz VNA measurement. So this is probably like a 6.5 gigahertz null or something like that, whereas this one has the null around 900-ish megahertz. And it's important to note that this is a 6 gigahertz probe, so having the null right around a little past 6, six gigahertz is not hurting performance that much. This one, though, this is a 1.5 gigahertz probe, and you've got your null at like 8, 900 megahertz. So that null is right in the middle of the operating band of the probe, and you're putting 17, 18 dB or so of uh, loading on your device center test. That's substantial, and admittedly, these are measurements across an open circuit. If you measure across a 50 ohm line, it's not as bad, but the time demand loading of this probe is still substantial, and you'll see that in a bit. So here is pretty much the same setup that we had before looking at the RC divider probe. Now we're looking at a slightly different zoomed in time scale because the uh, signals are higher bandwidth, but we can see our original signal here, and that big dip there is caused by the loading of this nominally low loading RC divider, or sorry, this nominally low loading resistor pro still has that two picofarads of capacitance and that unterminated stub there is enough to cause that fairly substantial dip on the rising edge. And again, we can see there's a bit of an overshoot, a little bit of ringing because of the capacitive peaking and uh, some of the other effects going on there. And so now if we compare that to the higher end probe with a shorter needle, we can see we've got almost no capacitive loading. There's this tiny little step in the edge that's barely visible. This is 500 picoseconds per division, by the way. So that little step we're seeing there is maybe 50, 75 picoseconds. It barely registers on the 16 gigahertz scope. And uh, then uh, we'll see that the entire line is just a little bit lower than the baseline. So what we're seeing here, this delta, is due to the 500-ish ohm DC loading of the probe. And so you are going to see a slight reduction in the amplitude of your signal, but it's not much. And so for most applications, this level of loading is completely acceptable. And compared to the RC divider probe, it's just it's not even comparable. And so talking about this input stub, ideally we want no reflection at all, but what are some ways we can get rid of this? Well, the first thing that might come to mind is, okay, maybe we can get rid of these reflections by matching the impedance of the tip to the resistance of the probe input. So, say if we have a 500 ohm probe, we want to have a 500 ohm input. And so, yeah, this will completely get rid of your mismatch. You'll get your reflection with a zero phase shift right at the junction where the tip touches your device at test. But it's not physically possible. Unfortunately, the impedance of free space is 377 ohms, which makes it essentially impossible to make a transmission line with an impedance higher than that. So a 10x or 20x probe, you basically can't get a match tip. With a 5 to 1 probe, you 
I mean, yeah, you probably could design a geometry that is going to give you a fairly decent match for that, but it would be awkward and likely from a mechanical perspective, it would be tricky to get good response that way. So the next best option is to make this stub really short and just move the null out of your band of interest. So you'll see a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, I've personally played with a couple of these for some of my own open hardware designs. Uh, like the AKLPT2, for example, is using castellations on the tip. So the tip solders directly to your device under test. And then coming directly out of that, you've got the resistor right on the other side of the via. So your stub is essentially the diameter of a via and the thickness of a flex PCB. Um, another thing that you'll see, and this is used more often in higher end commercial probes, is solder and damping resistors. So if you actually have, instead of just a solid needle, if you have a solder in uh, connection, you can actually make that connection be an axial lead resistor and put some of your attenuation in that resistance. And um, another thing that you'll see, this is more common in like higher end differential probes. Um, I think LaCroix's uh, DXX05 series and probably the DH series will actually make the probe needles out of conductive carbon fiber instead of metal. And uh, by deliberately making the tips resistive, they will actually have this distributed resistance along the length of the needle. So there's not a reflection further down, you actually have the beginnings of your attenuation in the resistance itself, in the uh, tip itself. So summarizing things, the resistive probe gives you an excellent price performance ratio. There's not really anything else out there that for a few hundred to maybe a thousand bucks or so is going to give you multiple gigahertz of bandwidth. There, there's no competition for that. And because it is just a resistor and, you know, maybe a few little tuning components, but for the most part, it's just a resistor, they're relatively ESD resistant. They don't tolerate sustained over voltages very well because these are generally small sensitive resistors that can dissipate uh, relatively low powers. And if you turn the power up too high by probing, you know, a 24 volt line or something, you'll probably burn out the resistor. But momentary ESD they're relatively immune to and again it's a generic design with a 50 ohm coax output so you can use it on any scope. Uh, the big downside is again you've got high DC loading you're not going to be able to use this on I squared C or something with a pull up. Uh, you may have disturbance to a DC bias if you're probing like SSTL for example DRAM signals that care about DC bias uh, you may start to run into issues. Uh, it is possible to mitigate this if you're using DC blocking capacitors and stuff like that, but uh, it is an issue to be aware of. You are, again, putting roughly a 500 ohm resistor to ground across whatever your probe point is. And then, again, as with the uh, RC divider probes, you've got relatively high attenuation, and so you are going to have problems with really weak signals having SNR limitations at even just being able to get the scope's front end gain to go high enough to see really weak signals and pluck them out of the noise, you will have problems this way. And so ultimately, they're a excellent general purpose probe for use for embedded debug. You can easily get out to a couple of gigabits per second with them. I've been able to use resistive probes for even like uh, one gig ethernet PCIe Gen 1. Uh, I don't remember if I've tried them for 10 gig ethernet yet, but they are more than adequate for up to a couple of gigabits per second. Uh, 50 ohm RF, they work great for. And so again, this is a probe architecture that I think really more people should be using. And it, I'm honestly surprised that more scope vendors don't push these as uh, almost, I would almost argue these should become a primary probe for general purpose use. Uh, so, question, why do resistive probes have to be expensive, blah, blah, blah. Well, okay, so the R&D involved in tuning them for the parasitics and trying to get good flat response is non-trivial. Um, I've got one open hardware resistive probe of my own design that is, uh, I think it's on its 13th PCB revision now. I've spent upwards of $20,000 of my own money on EM simulation software to model the details of... Uh, uh, ground plane resonances and return current paths and matching connectors to multiple gigahertz frequencies and caring about things like reflections between multiple resistors if you're using multiple series resistors to get the resistance you want and things like that. Uh, and honestly, a lot of it is just because of the captive market. Every other probe is expensive and the vendors know that people are used to paying this much, so they will charge you that much because you don't really have an alternative. <laughs> 
And that's one of the reasons why I've been working on open source resistor probe designs is because I understand that these don't really, the, the bill of materials in these probes is not actually that expensive. Most of my probe designs are tens to maybe very low hundreds of dollars in parts. Uh, and yeah, certainly if you're not trying to recoup R&D costs and if you're not trying to make a ton of profit off of them, you definitely could build a resistor probe a lot cheaper. Um, I would not recommend trying to rewire an existing RC divider probe just because the they're generally you know cast into blocks of plastic. You'd have to cut the whole thing open, and there wouldn't really be much of a handpiece left in order to be usable. And then the coax coming off of it is that lossy coax. It's not a 50 ohm line. It is not designed for use with any other kind of input. So I would not recommend rewiring an RC probe, but certainly you can build a serviceable resistive probe with parts that you find around the junk box in the lab. Um, I've got several open source probe designs on my GitHub. I'm still tweaking them. And uh, I've got one that I sell assembled units of now and uh, several more under development. And so all of my designs hit several gigahertz bandwidth and they're they're cheap. Uh, the AKLPT5 is the one I'm working on now that's currently three gigahertz. And I think I can probably push it out to five plus. It's a soldering resistor probe where the components are an SMPM connector, a uh, resistor that's a little bit tricky to find. Uh, I actually spent quite a while trying to track down this one particular Vichy part that is not available. Normally, you have to special order it for them, and yeah, then there's a large minimum order. It's just generally a pain in the neck to get the specific resistors that you want. Um, if you wanted a resistive probe, it's only good to uh, at, only as good as an RC probe. Uh, no. <laughs> so honestly, if you wanted a resistive probe that was only good to a couple hundred megahertz, get a piece of coax, cut the end off, uh, buy a, say, 450 ohm carbon composition resistor and solder it onto the center conductor and solder a little uh, length of wire onto the ground, twist the braid up together, solder maybe a little extension of wire, and you'll probably have no problem getting something good to a couple hundred megahertz. Uh, in the ham community, these are actually fairly common. So yeah, DIYing these out to a couple hundred megahertz is absolutely doable. It can be done for pennies. And again, I'm surprised more people don't do it. Uh, really, the challenge is when you want to get something that is good out to multiple gigahertz and has really smooth, flat response, really good impedance matching at the connector. It's, it's that last little bit of tweaking that is where it starts to get tricky. But yeah, certainly getting something that is lower loading than a resistive or than a RC divider probe and flatter response than an RC divider probe out to a couple hundred megahertz is not actually that hard. And so again, the, the, I, I think these probes are underutilized and it's an architecture that should get more love than it does. All right, next up is high impedance active probes. So these are, again, relatively straightforward from a conceptual perspective. There's a lot of devil in the details. Um, do I have a comparison of how a 400 megahertz resistive probe acts versus an RC? Uh, I don't have any examples off the top of my head. Um, if someone sends one to me, I will gladly throw it in the VNA and characterize it. Um, just, just Google resistive probe or transmission line probe. You'll find dozens of people who have built relatively basic ones and... Uh, they, they generally look pretty awful because they're just kind of hacked together out of a piece of coax, but they're, they're cheap. You can make as many as you want and stick them wherever you want. Um, yeah, they are, they are a lot less sensitive to grounding quality, so you can get away with a lot worse grounding, and if you have good grounding, you're going to get really nice bandwidth. Again, the challenge is trying to get it to be flat and not have too much peaking. Um, you still do have the same issues with an alligator clip or something. If you have a, you know, if you put a six inch ground on your resistive probe, yeah, you are still going to get worse performance, but is it going to be as bad as a six inch ground on a resistive or a RC divider probe? Absolutely not. It's going to be way better. And so if you use a fairly short length, again, especially if you make it a soldering probe, soldering connections are generally what you're going to use for higher frequency anyway. And so, yeah, you'll get really nice performance if you do that. Anyway, uh, back to the active probes. Um, so you've got a, typically it's a JFET based amplifier in the probe head. Typically there's gonna be a fixed hardware gain. And so you've got a large attenuation and then some gain after that. And so usually these are, these are gonna end up being maybe five to one, 10 to one net attenuation. Um, these also are going to have uh, uh, very high DC input resistance uh, and relatively low input capacitance. 
Uh, the big problem uh, that you'll see is a lot of these are made by scope vendors. Uh, they're not going to be portable across models. Uh, there are a few third-party ones. The big one I know of is the PMK Tetris, which uh, Pico will rebrand and sell uh, as active probes as well. Um, these take an external power supply and have a 50 ohm BNC output to the scope. And so you can go buy one of these and go use it with any scope you want. You just have to tell the scope it's a 10x probe and you're good to go. So uh, the one that we're going to be looking at in a little bit more detail is the ZS1500 from LaCroix. It uses the probe head from a Tetris, but was customized by LaCroix to have the probe as control pod. So now it's using the proprietary interface for power, and they also added offset capabilities. So now you have a plus or minus 12 volt offset DAC in there. And so you'll see it's 1.5 gigahertz. It says 1 mega ohm in resistance. But more importantly is... Uh, the input capacitance is 900 femtofarads compared to your RC divider probe is usually going to be in the 10 picofarad range. So you've got an order of magnitude reduction to the input capacitance. And so this is going to give you all the benefits uh, that you'll see with a resistive probe to some extent as far as not having as much of that ringing and overshoot from a long ground lead, uh, not having as much of the resonances going on, uh, less capacitive loading on your circuit. And so here's what our S11 looks like on this probe with what they call a leaf ground. It's basically a long, flat metal blade. And so you've got a relatively smooth roll-off out to 1.5 gigahertz, uh, which is the rated bandwidth. And it's, you know, it's, it's nice and smooth. There's not any big dips and resonances. It will eventually fall off a cliff when you get out to you know, 4 or 5 gigahertz, something like that. But you know, honestly, the probe is not designed to be used at that high frequency anyway. And so here's our S21, our forward path response. And so it's really nice and flat out to about 900 megahertz or so. And then it starts to dip a little bit. You got some ripples. And it's, in my testing, it's not actually a 1.5 gigahertz probe. Uh, you can see now we're down 8 dB at 1.5 gigahertz. Uh, and so our 3 dB bandwidth is actually somewhere in the, you know, maybe 1.1 gigahertz bandwidth range in this test. Um, other people have told me, I have not independently verified, one of the reasons for this dip is actually when you are hand-holding the probe, the design is not sufficiently shielded and it will actually couple to your finger. And so depending on where, what part of the probe body your fingers are gripping, you'll see more or less bandwidth. I haven't actually verified this myself, but it seems plausible because of how small the probe head is. And uh, in any case, these, these do not hit the full rate of bandwidth in my testing, but they're not bad. Certainly out to a gigahertz, they're very usable. And so here's an example of what the step response looks like of this probe with the leaf runs. You can see it's, it's very well behaved. There's almost no overshoot. It's just a smooth rising edge and, you know, a tiny bit of ripple, but not, not bad at all. And now we start to see another of the benefits of uh, the active FET probes here is this is the response with a 7 centimeter wire ground. Yeah, sure, you get a little bit of rounding on the rising edge, but it's, it's not bad at all. And so, again, with these, as with the resistor probes, because of the lower capacitance, you can get away with much worse grounding or alternatively get much better results with the same level of grounding. And so now we're going to take a look at the S11 comparison of the active FET probe across an open circuit compared to the resistor probe and the RC divider probe. So we can see with the RC divider probe starting at, like, maybe 80 megahertz or so, it's even worse than the resistive probe, and even right out of the gate, starting from DC, the FET probe has higher load, or has a lower loading, uh, uh, higher S11 than the RC divider probe. So it absolutely blows away the RC divider probe. There's, there's no competition here. And then we do still have that 900-ish femtofarads at capacitance, so we do see that slow roll off. And as we get out to, in this case, uh, 632 megahertz in this test, uh, the uh, Resistive probe starts to have lower loading. So as we start to get out to, you know, in the 1, 1.2, 1.5 gigahertz range, the resistive probe is still going to have lower loading. In the lower frequency bands, though, the FET probe does have very low loading, and it, it does beat the resistive probe. And so that makes it a great choice for lower frequency signals that are sensitive to loading. So here's an example of what our time-demand loading looks like here. Again, we can see there's a little bit of a dip here. It's, it's 
certainly not as bad as the RC Divider probe and uh, nowhere near that of the cheaper resistive probes. Uh, you do see, again, the higher frequency roll-off does mean your edge is a little bit rounded compared to what you would see with, say, the 6 gigahertz uh, transmission line probes. So these are very, very low DC loading. Again, they maintain their high impedance a lot longer than an RC divider because the capacitance is so low. That does, again, make them relatively tolerant of poor grinding. And a resistive probe is often going to be better because the resistive probe is usually going to have even lower capacitance. So, you know, the, the peak of resistive probe is, uh, I think the data sheet specifies the maximum input capacitance is like 400 femtofarads, and typical is less than that, whereas this one is 900 femtofarads. Big downside is obviously they're not cheap. Uh, the ZS1500, I want to say, is like somewhere around 2000 US dollars is the list price I got in mine for like 1200 as a refurb. Um, they're ESD sensitive since they are active circuits. Uh, and again, they, they usually do have relatively high attenuation still, and they do have some input capacitance. It's not zero, it's small, but it's there. And you can definitely see it at, again, when you start to get out into the gigahertz, the loading does still become significant compared to the resistive probes. And so these are great for general purpose embedded debug. Uh, they're excellent for loading sensitive lower speed signals. So a crystal oscillator, for example, is one of those really challenging subjects to probe because you've got relatively weak signals on the resonant tank itself, and your loading capacity is typically only going to be a couple of picofarads. And so if you take this this crystal that's loaded with, say, a 10 picofarad capacitor, and you put an extra 10 picofarads of probe across it, you're either going to massively pull the frequency away from where it should be, or maybe stop it from oscillating entirely. With a resistive probe, you're probably going to stop it from oscillating too, because again, your DC loading is so high, you're going to be sinking all that very limited drive current of the crystal, and it's not going to be able to oscillate. Whereas with the... Uh, FET probe, you've got a relatively low DC loading, but you've also got relatively low capacitance. And so that makes it a great probe for, again, looking at crystal oscillators and low to mid speed, very loading sensitive signals. They're great for general purpose embedded debug, again, up to the point where, again, when you get to maybe half a gigahertz or so, start thinking about resistive probes for sure. For lower frequencies, it's kind of a toss up. It depends on how loading sensitive you are. Um, but the big problem is, again, they're expensive, and uh, they do have still limited frequencies compared to resistive probes, so they're not, they're not something I would recommend you go out and buy a case of, even if you've got the budget. Okay, and uh, I'm now going to pause for two or three minutes and fill up my water because I've been talking for almost two hours and my mouth is getting dry, so... I'm going to be back in two minutes or so. Uh, you can all take a break and stretch your legs, and we'll resume with active differential probes in a couple minutes.
And all right, we're back. Um, okay, so asking about probing for very tiny signals. Um, we're going to get to some of that later on. Um, mostly talking about power rail noise, because typically you're looking at fairly weak ripples on a, a otherwise fairly strong signal. Um, I am touching that briefly when I talk about attenuation. Generally, a probe with higher attenuation is going to have worse sensitivity because ultimately the probe is passing the signal on through the scope. And so the more attenuation you have, the more attenuation, or sorry, the more attenuation your probe has, the more gain you have to add at the scope. And eventually we're either going to start to run into SNR problems or just the front end gain of the scope won't go any higher. Uh, yeah, I don't work with really weak signals. So that's a little bit outside my area of expertise. Uh, my gut feeling would be that you probably want some kind of an active probe, maybe even a custom LNA or something like that, depending on what you're trying to look at. Uh, any other questions on active FET probes before we move on to differential probes? <laughs> And uh, in case anyone is wondering about progress, we're about two thirds of the way through by slide count. So probably another 45-ish minutes that uh, the way things are going. Okay, so active differential probes are a differential amplifier fed by the probe tip. Uh, typically these are gonna be used for very high bandwidth signals, high speed serial and so on, and generally fairly low swing. Uh, we're gonna talk about high voltage differential probes separately. So we're not going to get into them at this point. Um, the things to consider with a differential probe are you've got a bunch of different range limits. So you do have to consider loading on your device under test. Uh, then you also have the common mode range. So if you're measuring the difference of two signals, you still can't have those signals be too far away from your nominal ground. Um, typically, this is going to be in the order of maybe three to five volts plus or minus common mode range for typical differential probes, although it, it varies a lot across models. Uh, then obviously you have to consider the dynamic range of the differential input, how far apart the positive and negative can be. And then of course, damage levels. You know, you don't want to be frying the probe if you give it a signal that's too strong. So you do want to pay attention to the maximum safe power. Um, all right, so grounding. The input signal is uh, going to be measured again it's a differential signal, you've got a positive or negative, and you're measuring the difference between them. But you do still need to have a DC ground reference for the probe to use, mainly just to keep that common mode in range. And so in the case of, uh, you know, one of the LaCroix probes I've got, the D400AAT, is plus or minus 2.4 volts common mode range. And so you need to make sure that your device under test ground is within no more than you know, a few tens to hundreds of millivolts of your scope ground uh, in order to uh, avoid going out of range of the probe. You do not, however, need a low inductance RF ground path, and in some cases you may actually want a little inductance in there to prevent noise coupling and make sure that you are taking a true differential mode measurement. And so here's an example of uh, one of the ways that you can ground a differential probe. In this case, this is a uh, LaCroix D420A, and it's got a little pin socket on the side of the amplifier that you can go plug a wire into. In this case, we're just clipped out to this ground pin on the other side of the fixture. And so we've got a pretty good distance, and this nice long inductive ground lead between the amplifier and the fixture. And the probe doesn't care at all because, again, we're taking a differential measurement between those two little tips right there. So uh, differential probes are generally fairly tolerant to ground inductance because you're not actually using the ground really for the RF portion of the measurement. And so as long as your scope is sharing the same ground, your common mode is going to be in range. And so generally most probe manufacturers are going to tell you, you know, you only need one of your probes to be grounded. You don't need to ground every single probe separately to your device under test. So if you're using a power supply where the negative rail is ground, you may even not need to ground it yourself. If you're plugged into, for example, USB power or something like that, you may be able to just use that as your ground. Um, you may be able to use the shield on a coax if you've got a coax output going to another scope channel, or if you're feeding a stimulus from a ground, a single generator into it. If you've got a grounded power supply, if you've got another probe with a ground, there's a lot of different options. But it is important to make sure that you have some sort of a DC ground, especially if you are probing a board 
where it is powered by a lab power supply because those generally will have floating outputs and it is very possible for them to float more than a couple of volts away from earth ground and so if you don't ground the device under test you may well exceed that common mode range and either get garbage or worse yet damage the amplifier and uh, these probe amplifiers are not cheap i want to say this one is three or four thousand i think for just the amplifier i know MSRP for the entire differential probe system, including the uh, tips, the amplifier, the power control cable, and some of got it somewhere around seven, 8,000. And so I think the actual amplifier module is about half of that. So yeah, certainly you do want to be careful with these things and not fry them by having bad grounding. And uh, this is another section where the lecture is still incomplete is uh, I'm going to have a simple schematic of a differential probe, but essentially you've got a resistive input stage you got a differential terminator of 100 ohms or so across a differential amplifier and then the output of the differential differential amplifier then drives your scope um, on that note actually most uh, differential amplifiers will actually have a differential output and so you'll have positive and negative outputs that when you're driving a 50 ohm scope input one of these differential legs is going to be just tied off with say a 50 ohm terminator to ground and the other one is going to drive the scope and you can also run into issues where for example the positive to positive and negative to negative might be well matched but positive to negative and negative to positive might be less well matched and so trying to use a differential amplifier in single-ended output mode can be tricky but most op amps are not meant to run at really high frequencies so it would not surprise me if we start seeing at some point scopes that actually have dual RF inputs on the front for positive and negative differential inputs. So you can say use one of the inputs as a, a uh, well, we have one of the inputs be used for a single-ended signal or use both of them for a differential signal and then have a differential probe that has a differential output. I've never seen that, but it would not surprise me if someone tries that at some point because I think it would give much better performance. All right, so next we're going to look at an example of what loading on one of these probes looks like. So this is using the same, the D420A, the probe that was in the last uh, photo. And so you can see that the shift in the signal going from without the probe to with the probe is almost imperceptible. There's almost nothing. I think the DC loading of these is in the hundreds of K ohms, and they get down to the several hundred ohm uh, range uh, across the whole frequency. And so the input capacity is extremely tiny, and uh, they're probably the lowest broadband loading of any kind of probe you're going to find. Of course, they're not cheap. So here's an example of some of the accessories that one of these higher-end differential probes comes from. This is uh, D1330 from LaCroix. So we've got the soldering tips here. They've got two of them that each have... Uh, well, We'll, we'll show a close-up on the next slide, I think. But they've got solder and resistors that you can solder directly to your device under test. You've got the handheld browser that has a little knob here that adjusts the uh, um, spacing of the tip needles up and down so that you can reach test points at a given spacing. There's a bunch of accessories and jigs that let you hold the probe at a certain position to land the probe on a test point without soldering it in place. Um, this one, I don't even understand why they have. This is a 13 gigahertz probe, and they include a adapter for probing 0.1 inch, 2.54 millimeter headers. This adapter is only good to about 3 gigahertz. They state this in the documentation. I don't even know why it's included. I've never used one. I've, I've never been in a situation where I've wanted to look at a multiple gigahertz signal, and it was on a 0.1 inch header. So, for whatever reason, they provide it, but yeah, I've never used it. Um, and then we've got all the different miscellaneous accessories, all the ball joints and the holders for solder and probe tips to keep them from moving around. And yeah, a bunch of Lego Technic pieces. I wasn't sure at first if these were just looked like Legos or what. And then I popped one under the microscope and I actually saw a Lego trademark on the mold of, I think, this one. So yeah, these are actual Lego pieces. And uh, it, I, I'm always amused of thinking of some engineer on company time from Teledyne walking into a Lego store and picking up a bunch of Technic parts that they're going to go resell for 20 times the list price. But, I mean, they, they work well, so whatever engineer's kid came up with this idea is a genius. <laughs> and here is a close-up of the soldering tip. This is the one we were just looking at right here. 
Looking at the close-up, we've got a 950-ohm series resistance here, and then an extra 100-ohm here. So we're looking at 1050-ohms on each leg, and then there's some differential resistance at the amplifier. Uh, what are the LEGO pieces for? So uh, the handheld browser probe has a uh, Technic socket here that you can go slide a rod into, and then this little tripod mount used the double-sided tape here, which is just custom-cut 3M command strips. Um, that you stick under the leg, stick it down to either a bench or the board, and then you've got this arm coming off the top with a sliding module. We've got a bunch of different ball joints and stuff, and so it allows you to essentially build a custom jig that will hold the probe head on your device under test at a precise position coming from a precise angle to hit a certain test point without having to solder it down. So it's a really nice system. It works very well. Anyway, so uh, the tip is, yeah, it's just, it's just two resistive probes. You can see we've got a, the ground terminals. Are, there's no actual ground terminal on the tip. There is. It looks like there's a ground plane in the Flex PCB that is only grounded at the other end and is just there for return currents. And then we've got the two essentially single-ended inputs here coming in separately. These resistors, by the way, are a giant pain in the neck to find. Uh, LaCroix sells replacements for them for, I think, like, 200 bucks for a five pack or something obscene and i think i've actually tracked down the oem part number for them and uh, i'm looking at using something very similar for some of my own probe designs so i'm about 95 percent sure these are vishe hml01 series which are almost impossible to find but i think i actually know what they are now so it's a step in the right direction uh, one thing to be aware of with these tips is that they are extremely fragile. To give you an idea of scale, those soldering resistors are a millimeter long and half a millimeter square. And uh, I think the wires coming off of it were like 29 or 30 gauge wire. So they have extremely limited mechanical strength. They basically can't handle any shear or tensile stress whatsoever. And so... Uh, you need to secure them very firmly, ideally secure the probe before you solder it, and then just slightly move the resistors until they're exactly over the test point and solder it in place. So here's an example. I was looking at some high-speed serial signals on a board here. I'm looking at, um, I think it's just some DDR RAM on this board, uh, using both a handheld differential browser probe and then two soldering differential probes here. So there's a bunch of different techniques you can use. It doesn't really matter how you do it, but it is absolutely critical to make sure that any solder and probe tip is very firmly mechanically attached to your device that are tests, again, ideally before you solder it, and then don't break that mechanical connection until you've desoldered it. Then you can start taking the tape off. These tips, just to give you an idea, this, this solder and tip, if I back up to here, um, is probably a thousand dollars to replace at manufacturer list price just for that tip so if you're in somebody else's lab and using one yeah you do not want to snap that tip off the resistors if the solder joint fails the resistors are replaceable uh, the resistors are actually considered consumable because it's assumed that at some point you're going to snap off either like right here or right here it's assumed that you're going to get a fracture from metal fatigue um, but obviously you know you don't want to overbend them and cause premature failures because these resistors are still expensive uh, and the same thing applies to the probe body. The amplifier is large and heavy if it rolls around. Um, yes, you can use differential probes in single-ended mode if you connect the uh, negative lead to a nearby ground. Yes, that is a very common technique. It's used for things like DDR RAM and stuff like that. You, you can, in principle, also use it for an arbitrary reference voltage. So in the case of DDR, you could measure against VREF and essentially get an SSTL input buffer on your a differential pro but yeah the most common single added scenario is going to be measuring to ground uh, so the amplifier yes yeah, so it's large and heavy I mean this thing weighs probably a couple of uh, ounces a few hundred maybe a hundred grams or so and so it's not something that you want rolling around and putting stresses on your probe tips so uh, they'll usually come with a tip I sorry, they'll usually come with a uh, bipod hold like this one. It's fairly heavy metal with uh, rubber feet to keep it from moving around too much. Um, I usually like to tape the wires down to the bench too. Again, just try and keep things from moving around too much. It's, it's going to be a lot easier as far as both 
making sure you have good electrical contact with any kind of a passive probe that is just sitting there with a needle, and also avoiding damage to either your probes or your device under test. So a differential probe is going to have relatively low DC loading. Again, you're, you're really, really low band in the tens to single digit megahertz and down at the kilohertz range. You're probably still going to be better off with an active FET probe as far as loading goes, but still, I mean, you're, you're looking at hundreds of K ohms. These are, these are very low loading. The capacitance is ludicrously tiny. I don't even know if they spec it. They usually, they start, you start thinking in terms of S parameters of these frequencies. Um, they are also very tolerant of poor grounding because, again, your ground is just being used to keep the common mode in range. So good or bad grounding almost doesn't even come into play because you're not using the ground as a signal contact anymore. You're using the ground as uh, just there to keep the DC roughly where it should, and then your two signal contacts are the only parts you really care about. Um, they obviously do a good job of noise rejection. If you have any kind of common mode noise in your circuit, if you're looking at a differential signal coming in over a long cable or something like that, um, they'll do a good job of removing that. Um, you can, of course, probe a differential pair by using two separate scope channels and either single-ended probes or direct coax inputs and then a math function. So if you don't have a differential probe, this is a good way to avoid it. But of course, you're going to get less good signals. You're going to have less dynamic range. If you have a lot of common mode noise, you're going to have to use a lower gain setting in the scope in order to make sure that you don't clip the signal on the A to D. And uh, then that's going to give you worse SNR because now you are also worse SNR and also more quantization noise because you got the same, say, eight bits of A to D converter spread across a larger portion of the signal. Uh, these differential probes generally are going to have fairly low attenuation. Uh, most of the ones I have are like 2.4, 3 point something attenuation. They're, they're weird factors because of what the input impedance of the amplifier is. But typically it's going to have a fairly high attenuation on the probe head, and then the amplifier brings it most of the way back to unity gain, but not quite. So you still have a little bit of attenuation, but, you know, again, 2, 3x attenuation, not 10x. Uh, big downside is you have, again, very limited range of what kind of inputs you can tolerate. They really do not like ESD or overvoltage or any kind of electrical abuse, uh, and they're not cheap. The, the lower end ones, like the LaCroix D420 and stuff, start in the low to mid four digits. Again, MSRP, I think, for a D420A is around 7,000 US dollars. If you shop around, you can score one on eBay for especially the older D420, not the A, which is almost the same. It just doesn't support the quick link tips. Um, you can score one of those anyway. I think I got one for like 1800 2000 or something like that uh, as a sketchy random eBay seller, and uh, I tested and it worked, so I got lucky, but you know, there was always a chance it wasn't going to work. Um, and uh, so even if you buy used like I do, they're still not cheap at all. Uh, the D1330 that I got, I think I paid about 6000 for as a refurb, and MSRP for that thing new is somewhere in the five digits, probably like eleven or twelve thousand. The general going rate is you're looking at at least a thousand dollars per gigahertz in bandwidth for something like this. Um, but yeah, if you have the budget, they're great. <laughs> so in general, when you're going to want to use these is high speed differential, uh, high speed single ended signals. If you have a reference voltage of some sort, again ground, VRAF, whatever, something you, you can use to make a differential measurement against. So for any kind of relatively weak high-speed signals, they are the probe of choice for sure. And now we're going to get to, uh, unless anybody has any other questions about differential probes before I move on. All right, seeing none, moving on. Active power rail probes. So these are something that is kind of, they've started to come on the market fairly recently and they're really useful. And I'm actually surprised they aren't more popular. Again, it's one of those things that's kind of, you don't really know about it until somebody tells you. So the main application you're looking at here is if you're trying to look for a weak ripple signal on a relatively large DC offset. So if you're trying to, for example, look at the input of a switching power supply or an intermediate rail, if you've got, say, a 48 volt DC being stepped down to 12 volts intermediate bus, and then uh, you're regulating from that at point of load to whatever your uh, 
final voltages you need on the motherboard or something like that. So a typical active probe is not going to have the DC bias capability to work with something that high. And uh, even at uh, lower voltages, if you're looking at you know a two volt, three volt power rail, uh, you will often still have problems with say a differential probe not being able to get large enough offsets to be able to see that, even if you're within the common mode range. Uh, you're not going to be able to measure relative to ground. So like the D420, for example, can measure plus or minus, uh, I think, 2.5 volts with up to a 5 volt common mode. But that doesn't mean you can just measure a 3.3 volt power rail because you would need to measure the 3.3 volt power rail relative to, say, a 1.6 volt reference voltage. So you got to get that from somewhere clean and not derive from your 3.3 volt power rail. Or otherwise, you're just going to be seeing the same ripple on that. Um, you can obviously eliminate some of the DC bias problems by doing AC coupled measurements, but then it's hard to do lower frequency transient analysis. And also, you want to have low attenuation in order to be able to see really weak ripples, especially when you're looking at high-speed serial transceivers, things where you've got ripple specs in the single-digit millivolts peak-to-peak, worst-case ripple and stuff like that. Um, but you also want to have low loading because if you go and throw a few tens or hundreds of ohms uh, of uh, DC loading across your switching power supply, you're drawing enough current that you're altering its behavior. And, you know, it might be switching from, say, uh, continuous PWM to uh, discontinuous mode or something like that at lower loads. So especially if you're looking at lower loads where things are in sleep state or something, you want a probe that is fairly low DC loading. And so the common architects that you'll see, there's a bunch of different manufacturers making these. Off the top of my head, I know at least... uh, Tech and uh, uh, LaCroix, and I'm pretty sure Keysight makes them too. I don't know if Roden Schwartz has one, but they probably do. Uh, I haven't seen a generic uh, portable one yet. I would actually like to build an open source one at some point, so who knows, I might get to that eventually. Uh, The basic idea is you split the signal into an AC and a DC path. The DC path is pretty much an active FET probe with a large attenuation and a large offset range, depending on the exact model you get. Uh, I've seen, I think uh, Keysight has, or no, is it Tech, I think, has one that goes out to 60 volts. Uh, LaCroix goes out to 30, and Keysight goes to 24. I'm, I'm losing track of whose vendors one is which. I know the LaCroix one that I have is 30 volts, and I know I've seen them out to 60. Uh, and then your AC path is essentially a coupling capacitor. So you pretty much get the benefits of an AC coupled direct measurement while also still being able to see the DC component. And because the AC path is entirely passive, you have extremely low noise on it. And you'll see in a couple of slides just how much of a benefit this is when you're trying to look at really subtle harmonics on a power rail. And again, I haven't got around to drawing the schematic yet. This is is still a work in progress. So the uh, example that we're going to be looking at here for power rail analysis, it's a uh, Digilent Zinc dev board, the Zybo, the the first generation, the uh, Z7000, not the current uh, Z7. We're looking at the one volt core power rail. So we're not making use of the really high offset, but at the same time, if we're looking at a few millivolts per division, you're not gonna necessarily be able to get one volt of offset with a lot of scopes. And so we're gonna be looking at using a differential probe across a decoupling capacitor and using a power rail probe across that same decoupling capacitor. So the differential probe we've got using the uh, handheld browser, we've got the two needles across C154 is the one of the main bypass caps right under the sock. And then here we're using the solder end probe. So the solder end tip for the RP4030 RP4030 is actually a coax that's been partially stripped at the end. So you've got the braided ground shield you solder directly to the ground of uh, your device header test and the center conductor you solder directly to the power rail. So it gives you really, really low parasitic connections. Uh, They also do support using, uh, I think it's MCX uh, solder in sockets or uh, UFL that gives you a lot less bandwidth. So for a lot of my boards, you'll see UFL test points. That's what they're designed for, is this probe will connect directly to the UFL and let you look at the power rail directly. And so here's what we're seeing with the differential probe. So we are running the stock uh, test Linux image that the board comes with from the factory. And uh, so I'm triggering off of the uh, Ethernet receive control signal. So when the frame arrives, we see the CPU wake up the rail sags as we suddenly start drawing more current. 
and in the spectrogram view, we start seeing some lower frequency on die activity. And then, of course, through the whole thing, we see the SMPS ripple and harmonics of the switching frequency and so on. So this is pretty cool, right? Being able to see all this data with the differential probe. All right, well, let's take a look at what the power rail probe shows us. You can see all the little details of uh, the individual SMPS cycles, even through all of the filter capacitors and everything. We're probing right across the decoupling capacitor, and we can still see this tiny little bit of ripple. And uh, additionally, we can see with the differential probe, we barely see the dip as the rail sags, but yeah, there's maybe a little bit of overshoot visible here. With the power rail probe, you can clearly see the overshoot as the load goes away, and it takes a little bit, probably looks like maybe 30, 40 cycles or so for the control loop on the DC-DC to react to the transient and start bringing the voltage down to where it should be. And then the noise floor on the spectrogram is massively lower. We can start seeing on-die clock activity. We can start seeing harmonics of on-die clocks. We've got the 125 and 108 megahertz, or uh, yeah, 120, 125 and 108 megahertz here. And then we've got the uh, 216 and 250 megahertz second harmonics of each clock here. We can see some more switching activities. This is probably like a timer interrupt or something going off every, maybe, looks like maybe every, five or 10 microseconds, there's a Linux kernel timer interrupt probably running here. And then of course we can see a lot more detail in the activity on the power rail. So it looks like it actually has two different spikes of activity when it's processing the ping packet. There's a shorter spike here, maybe when it's receiving it and then it wakes up the ping executable. And I'm not entirely sure what the details are here, but the point is you can see a lot more on-die switching activity, which allows you to not only identify disturbances in your power rail, but you can trace them to on-die activities and you can figure out which on-die actions are triggering it. You can find the particular frequency band that your noise is in and target your decoupling to optimize for lower noise at those bands rather than trying to create just generic broadband decoupling. Now you know exactly what your problems are and you can optimize for transients of that frequency. And so here's a better view of the spectrogram zoomed out a little more. You can see even out to you know 1.1 gigahertz, 1.3 gigahertz, we're still seeing internal clocks on the power rails. And this is on a rail that has ripple in the, let's see, we're looking at what's our scale here. So that's, that's like two millivolts. So we're seeing microvolt level ripples in the power rails very clearly here. So if you're trying to debug very subtle power integrity problems, and if you're trying to get really low amplitude measurements of uh, power noise and uh, optimizing decoupling for, again, high-speed serial and uh, CPU core clocks that are particularly critical and sensitive to interference, it is a great tool, and there's not really anything else out there that can get this good. Um, if you use just a capacitor and a piece of coax, you can get close for some stuff. Um, as far as pricing goes, um, the RP430 that I'm using, I think is around 3000 US dollars new. Again, I got to use one for a little bit less, I think. Uh, I think the Keysight uh, one is somewhere around 7000 There's a bunch of different versions depending on how much bandwidth you want. Uh, they've got the N7020A and I think the N7040A are different bandwidths from Keysight. Um, so there's a bunch of different options with different price performance. LaCroix only has the one four gigahertz model. So uh, overall, again, this, this type of probe is gonna have extremely low noise, very low attenuation. You can pick up, again, microvolt level signals on a power rail with potentially tens of volts of DC offset. And there are very few things out there that can do this. Um, they are expensive, uh, they've got fairly limited dynamic range, and they're not really good for anything but power analysis. So if you're doing a lot of work on high-speed digital stuff that is really sensitive to power analysis, then yeah. Um, if I wanted to build something up to 500 megahertz, um, I'm not sure yet. Um, I would like to build a power rail probe open source. I have not had a chance to really do serious design on it. If you Google around, there's a few people that have schematics that they published for partial 
work in progress power rail probes that where they were trying to target about a gigahertz or so of bandwidth and they seem to be pretty decent so i was planning on seeing what i could learn from some of those designs and then try and push it out to a couple of gigahertz of bandwidth and actually characterize it out that fast with a vna and so on and uh yes actually uh, as far as dpa goes yes these 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 would be very good for dpa um i've actually uh had findings in reports at work for finding power side channels from this sort of thing so yeah they are they are great for that kind of testing as well um that being said if you can put a shunt resistor in the power path you can just put a differential probe if you have a big enough shunt then you can get a stronger signal that way looking at the current signal instead of the dip in voltage so in general you would be using one of these probes for power integrity work and I guess if it's any other situation where you have millivolt signals on a big DC bias, I can't think of anything beyond power ripple, but if you did have such a situation, these would be a great problem. And now we're getting down to the last two sections that are, again, still a little bit incomplete, so there's not quite as much meat in these sections as I would like. Uh, so the first one is going to be near-field loop probes. And so these are essentially antennas that pick up RF energy, either magnetic or electric fields, uh, and are used for EMC testing. So, uh, uh, question, let's see, in voltage control audio filters, um, looking for very low amplitude audio on a bias voltage, uh, yeah, it might, might, it might work for that. Uh, of course, you could also just AC couple the signal, and that would probably be good because you're not looking at the bias. Unless you're trying to study if the bias is dipping when you have a big surge in the audio or something like that, then it would actually be a good use for that. Uh, okay, so, yeah, near-field loop probes are typically used for EMC testing or for, again, pre-compliance testing, identifying when you fail EMC testing, how it happened. Uh, they are not good for quantitative measurements because by design since they work in the near field they're very sensitive with the precise positioning and orientation of the antenna relative to your device center test so if you move your antenna further away from your device center test you get less coupling and essentially your probe attenuation increases and so if you want to determine am i going to fail emc testing at a given frequency based on how much far field radiation you have it's going to be difficult but if you just want to compare A, B on two different PCB layouts and see which of the two radiates more and you hold the probe the same distance away, it's good for that. Uh, again, ratiometric measurements are good uh, with these. Um, the big thing that they can do that almost nothing else can is they allow you to track down the precise physical location of an emitter. And so if you're doing a far field measurement, you may know that you're radiating at 100 megahertz. Okay, well, where on the board? You know, you got 100 megahertz going to three different chips and a bunch of different traces. Okay, what is radiating exactly? And so if you say, if you know you've failed compliance at a given frequency and you know you're 10 dB over the margin, you can use the near field probe at a fixed distance and be like, okay, I've made a bunch of changes. I've added some more ferrites here. I've added a terminator there. I'm now seeing 20 dB less emission at 100 megahertz. You're probably going to be at least 10 dB down to the far field. But you do want to add some safety margins because, again, the far field and near field performance don't necessarily scale exactly. Um, general technique for these is you start with one of the larger loops, which are more sensitive but less uh, selective, in order to be able to do longer range scans to quickly find the rough location, and then you gradually switch to smaller and smaller loops to find the exact location of an emitter. And you can use these straight into a scope directly for stronger signals, just right into a 50 ohm input. Uh, you will often want to add an external LNA if you're trying to pick out weaker emissions. And yeah, you, you can definitely DIY near field probes too. I haven't tried that because the ones that I had, uh, the ones that I have, uh, you can buy from TechBox uh, on Amazon and I think uh, Signal Hound and a few other places resell them. It's like maybe 300 bucks for the whole set of, I think it's three electric and one magnetic field probes, something like that. Um, they're, it's a fairly good size set and it's not that expensive. And so it's, unless you're on a really tight budget it's usually a good idea to go buy them but yeah certainly you can diy them um, these probes are generally super broadband that even the cheap ones go out to a couple of gigahertz again they're really about the only option for spatially locating an emitter on a board you can with the really small ones you can even get down to like plus or minus a couple of pins on a chip to track down the exact 
location of the emission. Um, and they allow you to do benchtop, for, to some extent, EMC testing. And there's not really any other way to do that. And yeah, sure, a calibrated antenna in a giant anechoic chamber is going to be great, but you need a giant Faraday cage, and you need a known calibrated antenna and spectrum analyzer, and you have to precisely measure all the distances involved. And it's it's a giant pain in the neck. They're huge. They're not cheap. And uh, typically, it's useful to go use these probes for quick finding and fixing of obvious problems and getting a rough idea how your design is looking and then you send it off to get compliance testing and hopefully you pass and if it fails now you know okay what frequencies am i failing at you can track down the exact location of your emitters and then go address them uh, of course the sensitivity is also a downside in that because it is so spatially sensitive it's hard to get any kind of a quantitative measurement and again it doesn't really translate that well to the far field anyway so determining whether you're going to pass or fail in advance can be a little tricky unless you have like no detectable emissions at all and again this is more of a specialized probe about the only use is tracking down the source of an emc problem so if you're not either doing pre-compliance testing or post-compliance failure analysis there's, they're not really too useful and finally, we're on the last section. Now we're going to get to discussing current probes. Any more questions on near-field probes before we continue? All right, without further ado, off to current probes. And this is, again, a very much incomplete section. I'm going to be adding more content here eventually. So there's a lot of different types of current probes, and I'm going to have to actually do a bunch of reading on this because I didn't even know some of these existed, and uh, I'm not going to be able to cover them in much detail until I study some more. But you've got the classic current transformer, which is essentially just a coil of wire wrapped around the signal under test and coupling a measured amount of it off and then feeding that into an ammeter and scaling it up appropriately. Uh, you got Hall effect sensors looking at the magnetic fields, uh, Bergowski coils, which I'm not as familiar with, flux gate magnetometers, and then an interesting one uh, known as anisotropic magnetoresistive sensing, which behaves similar to Hall sensors, but in some cases can have higher bandwidth and has some other useful properties. Uh, and then finally, it's not strictly a current probe, but I'm going to include it here because it is a way of measuring current, is to just put a shunt resistor in the path and measure across that with the differential probe. So here's an example of one type of current probe, uh, courtesy of Weston Brown at Stanford, who actually designed this prototype. Uh, he calls it the little B because it's a B-field probe. And uh, it is a positional probe using an AMR sensor that allows you to measure current in a non-contact manner without actually uh, breaking any connections to the board without needing to wrap around a conductor. So most of the types of current probes involve a closed loop sensor that has to completely encircle the signal under test. And so you need to have it be either a wire coming off of a terminal block or something, or you know a mains power cord or something like that. Or alternatively, you can have it be a uh, you can have it be a physical wire loop coming up off the PCB up across and down that is specifically designed as a test point for current probing. Of course, again, these take up space in your board and you have to have known you wanted to measure the current in advance. So uh, the advantage of the positional probe is they just couple directly to traces in the PCB. They tend to be less used for quantitative measurements because, as with the near-field probes, they essentially are near-field probes. Um, they are less useful for quantitative measurements because the coupling does vary with positioning, but they're great for general high-level analysis. And if you're, if you're mainly concerned about things like the phase and timing of current waveforms rather than the exact amplitude, they're excellent because you can just move it over a trace in the PCB and go get a measurement. Uh, TTI has one as well. They, uh, it's called the TTI Positional Current Probe, or I forget the uh, part number from TTI, but I've heard good things about it. Um, and so, in general, other than obviously putting a shunt in a differential probe, and the big advantage of these current probes is that they don't require breaking the circuit to add the shunt. Uh, downside, there's a bunch of different, I mean, the, again, this is, this is probably going to get expanded a little bit because there's so many different kinds of current probe. I may even have to make multiple sections to discuss them in more detail. Uh, a lot of the transformer-based ones will only see AC, whereas the magnetometer-based ones can see AC and DC because they'll pick up static fields. Um, most of the classical ones are extremely fragile. The, they actually have a hall sensor that is actually, I believe it's a thin film core deposit, or thin film sensor deposited directly onto the ferrite core. 
in order to get the best possible coupling. The problem is this makes them extremely impact sensitive. And so if you drop one of these things, it's probably dead and there's not really any way to repair them. So if you see one of these things on eBay and you don't have a good return policy and they don't absolutely confirm it's working, you probably want to pass it up because it's probably been dropped. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, these uh, current loop probes typically do have to clamp around a wire. It is going to be hard to measure signals on the board. You need to design in advance test points in order to be able to measure current there. You can't just measure around a random PCB trace. And again, that's where the positional current probes come in handy. Uh, and most of these are designed for motor control and appliance power and uh, high current applications. So it, it it can be more challenging to measure lower currents for really low power stuff. And so that's when you start looking at things like shunt resistors and differential probes to be able to measure really weak currents. Because a lot of these current transformers and stuff don't work really well for in the milliamp range or a couple of milliamps. It's certainly down to the microamps. They're not going to handle that well. And so in general, you're going to be using current probes if you're designing custom switching power supplies, motor control, looking at three-phase motor optimization and things like that. And, uh, oh, I almost forgot there's one more section at the end on high voltage probes. I was just thinking we were on the last section. <laughs> so again, there's a bunch of different designs of high voltage probes, as with current probes, and some of this may have to be broken up into multiple sections because of the diversity of types. So you've got the conventional passive high voltage probe, you've got the fiber isolated probes, and then high voltage differential probes. So high voltage passive probe is pretty much the same classic RC divider probe we talked about at the very beginning of this lecture. The difference is they've got much higher attenuation. So in this case, the LaCroix PPE5KV is a 5 kilovolt rated probe that has 100 to 1 attenuation instead of 10 to 1. Then the fiber isolated probes are quite interesting. These are designed for certain types of power conversion applications. I think like uh, gallium nitride gate drive applications and things like that where you're looking at measuring a couple of volts of uh, uh, signal on a massive DC offset. And so uh, these have common mode ranges that ran go into the tens of kilovolts because you're, you're basically just measuring through fiber optics and there's no DC connection between your device that are cast in the circuit at all. There's not even really any short, thin dielectric film or anything like that across a transformer core. And you've got a fiber that can be feet or meters long between your transmit and receive assemblies. Um, so you've got your isolated front end, typically independently powered, driving a transmit optical subassembly that then goes through fiber and your receiver feeds the scope input. These are generally not a simple linear circuit. You initially hear about this idea and you're like, oh, okay, you just you know uh, directly intensity modulate the laser. Well, the problem is that fiber transceivers are typically not very linear and they're not really designed, you know, they're designed for digital communication applications. They're not designed for sending uh, analog signals. And so uh, these are usually going to use some sort of digital modulation or at least an analog uh, time-based rather than amplitude-based uh, modulation, so a phase modulation or a frequency shift keying or something like that. So the uh, HVFO 108 is uh, FM-based. I don't know off the top of my head if anything is phase shift-based. It wouldn't surprise me if there's some PSK-based ones as well as FSK. And then finally we get to high voltage differential probes. So these are active differential probes with really large attenuation. And so in this case, we got switchable 101,000 to one attenuation with huge common mode ranges and huge differential ranges. And so this lets you look at three phase power, for example, measuring the differential voltage from one phase to another and things like that. And so in general, uh, so as far as battery powered scopes, um, it is possible to do that. Uh, the big downside is it does not have the ability to look at the whole system. So if you're looking at multiple parts of a complex system that are kilovolts apart, you can't see both of them in the same scope. Um, the bigger problem with the battery powered scope is that now the entire chassis is now floating at high voltage and it does become a shock hazard if you're not really careful. Uh, that being said, that is a possibility and certainly if you have a scope that has, say, Ethernet control, you can go plug in a fiber optic media converter, power the scope off of some local batteries or something, have Ethernet control over fiber and isolate the whole scope. And yes, again, it is an option. It's just that it is very easy to create a situation in which all exposed metal on the scope chassis is floating at 20 kV and it's going to electrocute anybody who gets near it. So 
the nice thing about the fiber probe is that the amount of li exposed live components is much smaller. And again, it lets you combine both the uh, uh, high side and low side of your system on one, pro on one scope and have trigger synchronization between them and so on. Um, as far as downsides, again, these are generally fairly specialized systems that are designed for one type of measurement. They're not really good for much else. Um, very often, they'll need their own batteries. They're not going to be something you can power by the scope. Some of them are like a lot of the higher-end LaCroix high-voltage differential probes, I think, do include an isolated DC-DC converter for powering the remote head, but most of the lower-cost ones do require batteries. Um, a lot of the passive RC divider probes do not handle high-frequency like RF power amplifier output, for example, uh, they don't handle that very well. Um, they typically, because of various parasitics, they will start to overheat or have capacitive peaking at higher frequencies. And so you either pass too much signal through and fry the scope or dissipate too much power and damage the probe. So uh, the conventional low voltage RC divider probes do have the same issue, but the high voltage one, this is especially important to pay attention to. And generally your bandwidth is gonna be limited. You've got you know, tens of megahertz, a few hundred megahertz. You're not gonna, it's, it's very difficult to get hundreds of megahertz to gigahertz at high voltage. So it's going to be hard to, you know, if you want to look at probing an X-band power amplifier or something like that, it's going to be challenging. And in general, you're going to use these if you're measuring high voltages or if you need DC isolation. And then uh, any other questions on high voltage probes before we get to the conclusions? All right, so now we're going to get into just a few little tips and tricks and comments on probing technique in general. So one that is very inexpensive and a lot of people never know until I show them is these little bipod probe holders, which, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious how you use them. You stick the probe into the hole. There's a couple different holes you can use for different types of probes. You can either stick the end of the probe or the cable end in. And... Uh, position a whole bunch of probes around a device under test. Um, the big downside to these is it can be tricky to use a spring ground with them because uh, they are fairly heavy, but trying to overcome the spring pressure can be a little challenging. So trying to get good contact with the spring ground is hard. Usually I'll use these for lower speed measurements with the alligator clip ground or if I'm using a solder and pro. Um, also the bipod is a fairly large base in order to make it stable. And so you'll see in this photo, I've got five probes around this board, and there's not really any space to go fit an additional probe around. So if you're trying to do six, seven, eight measurements, especially if you're looking at a lot of stuff, I'm probing different pins on one QFN. Um, as far as a helping hand, yes, it can be done. Um, the challenge is a lot of them are not meant for really stable measurements, and it's hard to get them to not move around and jiggle. Um, they it's easy to knock them off balance. You don't want to be using an alligator clip on your probe cable because you can damage the coax. So yeah, if you tape the probe onto it and can secure it well, yeah, you, you, there, there's a lot of different ways you can hack together a probe positioner, but these things are like 20 bucks a piece. And so for most people, you can afford at least a few of them. And so it's one of the things that I just, I think people should keep on hand. But yeah, certainly a helping hand can be hacked in order to do this. And I mean, I've rigged up probe positioners out of, electrical tape and whatever random objects I had that are about the right dimensions. So there's a lot of different options. Um, another thing is, again, I was talking earlier about securing cables. This is a perfect example of how having all of your cables well managed and taped down to the bench and secured with either cable management uh, bars or things like that. Um, yeah, plexiglass sheets that are over there. I have not seen those, but yes, yeah, that's a good example of another something you could use. So there's a lot of different techniques. The point is you're not an octopus when you want to probe more than two channels, or even if you want to probe two channels and have a free hand to change scope settings or something, it's really nice to plan in advance what you're going to be probing, how you're going to get the probes there, how you're going to get the probes to stay in place, and so on. So... Ultimately, in conclusion, there's a huge number of types of probes out there. There's a massive multiple orders of magnitude ranges in prices. Again, I mean, we looked today at probes with prices ranging from $10 to $10,000. And some of them are very general purpose. Some of them are specialized to one particular type of measurements. And uh, 
it helps to understand exactly how your probe works and uh, what the limitations and non idealities and so on are, because otherwise it's very easy to get garbage results by using PAR techniques. And uh, yes, mouth held probe, uh, it's not something I would recommend, but I've seen it done. All right, and uh, we're done. Any final questions? Okay, well, thanks everyone for uh, sticking it out through what turned out to be a uh, two and a half hour lecture. And uh, definitely let me know on Twitter or IRC or anything if you have any feedback for the final version of the class. I am still working on tweaking the slides, so let me know if you have any feedback. And thank you, and uh, I will see you next time.